Did everybody get that? <laughs> Or unless you're expecting, well, if somebody talks from the outside in, that's my only way of hearing. So you can leave it on. I'm not going to get feedback, am I? I don't think so. Well, I'm talking now and I'm unmuted, so it doesn't sound like it. Right? All right. It's on the same device, so it shouldn't give you All right. All right. Well, uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, my name for, I guess we should start with introductions. My name is Dustin Grant, zoning administrator for, or director of zoning and land conservation uh, for Adams County. I've been here uh, about three and a half years now. I have been in this uh, line of work for about 24 years now. Uh, the rest of my staff, uh, Rich and Joe, they're out on, uh, Rich just ran back to the office. Joe's out on inspection right now. He'll be here shortly. Those are my two building inspectors. Uh, and then I have uh, the heartbeat of the operation, Lauren and Janine. They're the first line. Generally, when you call in, they're one of the two you're going to talk to. Uh, and then Dan was wandering around here someplace. Uh, he's also one of my uh, code enforcement officers. Uh, the other division that I have is land and water. Uh, the only representative here today is Carolyn. Uh, you'll hear from her later. And we also have Kyle, Chuck, and Megan in that office. Yeah. Uh, and then also my third division is GIS, which is like the online mapping, uh, parcel mapping, and that his, that's Sam. So uh, zoning and land conservation definitely uh, Speak of the devil, that's Joe, one of the building inspectors. Missed introductions, so had to catch you up. And uh, so Adams County, under zoning and land conservation, does has about 16 ordinances that we enforce. Covers 689 square miles and the roughly 21,000 citizens. Uh, they always say you're supposed to start a presentation with a joke or whatever. I'm not that funny, so we'll just start with that. Um, that's a picture that was actually taken in Adams County. One of my inspectors went out, sent that to me and said, um, are there any issues? Uh, <laughs> one second here. Okay, so uh, about a month before that, uh, they actually had a brand new septic system installed, went out for an electrical inspection and, and he saw this, um, has a water line going to it, pitched to the <laughs> septic system. Uh, the, the only problem I saw with it is about 20 feet in front of it is the neighbor's property line. Is this for real? Huh? Is this for real? Absolutely. Uh, it is no longer there. They, uh, they they chose to remove it on their own. All right, so zoning. Uh, ran, land regulation basics. What is zoning? It's the act of partitioning a, a municipality or, or an area into different areas. Watch us in the next slide. Is that what I'm sharing? Yeah, I'm sharing. Bear with me a second. Okay, so let's stop sharing. Share. Okay, so partitioning and municipality into areas, uh, keeping similar uses together or intended to have similar uses together. It's been around since about 1916. It's gone to all the state Supreme Courts, US Supreme Court, and it's always been upheld as being constitutional. Um, it's, it's what you do on your property does affect the neighborhood, your neighbors, um, a broader area than just your property. 
and it can be specific to a topic or an entire area, for example, a town or um, for a specific topic, uh, we only want to regulate cell towers, something along those lines. So history of our department a little bit, uh, started back about 1969. That's when sanitary permits started for your septic system. Shoreline zoning was adopted shortly after that. Uh, the building construction ordinance about 10 years later, and then we've gone through uh, the comprehensive zoning, which a town has to can choose to adopt. Um, those first ones were in 1983. So it's been around in Adams County for, for quite a while. Uh, floodplain came a little bit after that, 1987. Land division, cell tower, and then uh, one of our newest ordinances is the tourist rooming house ordinance, uh, the short-term rentals, Airbnb, that kind of thing. Uh, over the course of all those years, uh, various towns over the years have adopted county zoning. And um, so I said the first three were in 1983, the most recent being Town of Monroe adopted county zoning in 2018. So there are, as I said before, there's 16 different ordinances. Uh, 10 of those are zoning ordinances. The remaining are part of the land and water division, but there's quite an interplay between them. This picture here, you can see uh, all the bright colors. That's what's under shoreland zoning. The hash lines are under uh, comprehensive zoning. And then this orange, which does extend up and through is floodplain. Those are three different ordinances, three different sets of regulations. This is along the river. It's 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 unique that you have that many, but um, it, it does happen. Now, if two or more ordinances apply, the more restrictive is always the one that you have to follow. Oops. So uh, what I want to do is go over each of the ordinances, a little bit about each one, um, how it affects anybody in this room, how it affects the county. Uh, and then what I want to do is at the end of the presentation, we'll, we'll do questions. So make sure you're jotting your notes down. And um, So one of the first ones I want to talk about is the land division ordinance. This regulates anybody who wants to, or any time you want to split your property in half or combine lots or change lot lines, the land division ordinance generally kicks in. It is in effect countywide. We don't have to have a land division ordinance, but it's very smart to have one. Uh, and it, it regulates a number of those things that I said, transfers of property, accesses, easements, condos, subdivisions, and any other plats that happen. Um, how it can be Modified now. This ordinance does not regulate how big you can go or how big it a parcel has to be. Just says if you're going to split it, here's how you have to do it. There is a very minimal minimal requirement, but all of our zoning districts and throughout the county, everything's higher than that. Uh, 15 acres is a magic number. If you're creating a parcel less than 15 acres in size, you have to have it done by a certified survey map, and that's and that's pretty standard throughout the state. Um, some go as high as if you're creating a parcel 40 acres or less, you have to do it by a certified survey map. So here's the types of surveys. Uh, you have CSM is a certified survey map. That's probably the most common one we hear about. If you're getting into slightly larger parcels and, and you're creating more or less a subdivision with the larger parcels, you can do it as a county plat. It has a little bit less review. It doesn't have to go to the state. A subdivision plat, that's when you're talking what most people typically think of as a subdivision, small lots, 50 of them all next to each other. Most of the time that has to go to the state for approval as well as whatever town it's in and the county. Uh, and then you have plat of survey. Generally that's the parcels already existing. We're not changing lot lines or dividing it. We just want a, a nice picture of where it is. Um, those don't get filed in the register of deeds. You can't use them as a legal description. It's, it's more of a reference document than anything else. So chapter 391 administration ordinance, uh, again, it's county choice. The purpose of this ordinance is it 
pulls out the uh, the administration portion out of all of our uh, various ordinances, houses it in one in one document. Uh, it contains pretty much all the information about how you obtain permits, uh, penalties, enforcement, and then it also for those of you in the I know I have some board of adjustment members here. Um, the things that they can do or what they're responsible for, what the planning and zoning committee is responsible for. So we'll start with the board of adjustment. Uh, and this is where a lot of the town members do have interaction with the county, whether it's through the board of adjustment or the zoning committee. But the board of adjustment, it's currently a five member board. Uh, they can't change an ordinance. They can't say, well, you know, that's, that shouldn't be there. We're, we're, we're going to fix that. The ordinance says what it says. When somebody needs to do something different, they go to the board of adjustment to um, to deviate from that requirement. Uh, for example, the ordinance says you have to be 10 feet from a property line. I can only be eight. It's the board of adjustment that would decide whether or not you can do that. Uh, they decide on variances, special exceptions, and another one, and then appeals. And we'll get into each of those in a little bit here. Uh, they're supposed to serve a three member three three-year terms and it is once you have county zoning it is required by state statute that you have the board of adjustment and anything in front of the board of adjustment is a public hearing so the first one's variance there's two types of variances an area variance and a use variance area variance was the example i gave uh there's some dimensional standard you can't meet it that's an area variance um the criteria to be approved or to obtain approval for a uh, variance, no alternative locations or options, no harm to the public interest, think uh, I wanna be closer to the road, is it gonna create a safety issue with traffic? Uh, and the third one, which is always the hardest to prove is without the variance, I can't get the intended use of the property. Uh, for example, I have a 100 foot by 100 foot lot, I have a building envelope in there. I, I could build a house, but I want to put it really close to the to the property line. If the board turns you down, you can still get the intended use of the property, which is residential. It's one of the uses that are listed as a permitted use in the ordinance. So they they probably shouldn't turn it down because you have a compliant location. You're just choosing not to use it. On the flip side, let's say I have a 40 by 40 lot, extreme example. I cannot build a house any place on that lot. I, I, no matter what I do, I cannot meet the setbacks. At that point, the intended use is residential because it's zoned R1. Should they grant a variance? Probably, um, because it does meet that, that criteria that if they say no, you can't use it for what it's meant to use, be used for. A use variance is a little different. Um, every zoning district, and we'll get into that later, um, has certain permitted uses that are allowed uh, a house hiking trails or whatever you can, you can list a whole bunch and you want to do something different than that that becomes a use variance the state supreme court has basically said those are illegal to grant because one of the criteria as i said before is you can't get the intended use of the property the intended use is what the ordinance says is allowed there you want to do something else but the permitted uses would you could do those so you can't meet that third criteria. So a use variance is illegal to grant. Special exceptions. Uh, under the shoreline zoning ordinance, you have every section says, here's the permitted uses. Here's uses that are allowed by special exception. Used interchangeably with conditional uses, um, which you may be a little bit more familiar with. Special exceptions are in front of the board of adjustment. Conditional uses are in front of the zoning committee. Um, the criteria, the criteria is different than a variance. Is there a need? Is it compatible with the surrounding uses? Is it going to create an issue with the, the neighborhood? Um, you can also, there are a few other cases where you use special exception. Um, for those of you who are on plan commissions and the town boards, you've probably seen some of these applications come through. Uh, if somebody wants, they're on the shoreline and they want to excavate an area that's uh, 4,000 square feet. Uh, they want to regrade their shoreline or whatever. Something like that would have to go to the Board of Adjustment for a special exception. Uh, and it, it, again, it occurs for a specific use, very detailed use. 
this is what they would vote on and say yes or no. It doesn't open it up to every possibility. And they can place conditions on that. Uh, and the example I gave, maybe they would, the, the board could put a, exam, uh, a condition on that. You have to have silt fence to make sure that that 4,000 square foot of disturbed ground doesn't end up in the lake. So as I was saying, every district has listed special exceptions. I'm not gonna read the slide, it's in the ordinance, but here's all the special exceptions that are listed in recreational residential under the shoreline zoning ordinance. So if you wanted to put in a nursing home, that's a special exception and it would go before the board of adjustment. They could put a, a condition on that you can't have more than 10 residents or uh, anything that material, material, yeah, directly isn't related to the request. Another function of the Board of Adjustment uh, is appeals. Uh, these are rare. In 24 years, I've seen two. When I make a, as a zoning administrator, when I make a decision that uh, negative, generally negatively affects somebody and uh, deny a building per, or deny a zoning permit or um, some other interpretation of the ordinance, any affected party can appeal my decision to the Board of Adjustment and they can't change the ordinance. They, it's not about whether you should be allowed to use that property for that use. It's as a zoning administrator, did I interpret the ordinance correctly and apply it correctly? Then we move on to the zoning committee. Um, it's a five county, there's five county board members, two citizen members, a number of them are here today. Uh, they hear all rezones and conditional uses. And then they don't micromanage the department. They're there for guidance. They're there to enact legislation and amend ordinances as well. So for conditional uses, it's identical to special exception. Conditional uses are used in the comprehensive zoning ordinance. Each district has certain uses that are allowed by issuance only of a conditional use. So you have your permitted uses. Most of the time there's a house included in that. Okay, well that's permitted. You don't necessarily have to go to any special meetings, um, meet the setbacks, you're good to go. But let's say you want to do something, uh, well, like in that one example, say a nursing home. All right, it's not necessarily prohibited in that district, but let's take a closer look at it, maybe get some conditions in place, make sure it does fit in and it's not going to create issues. Um, Again, it only allows for that specific use. Rezones. Uh, changes to every property in a zone township has a zoning district. Uh, could be A1 or there's 12 different districts, I believe. This, somebody is asking to change that from one district to another. Typical reason is each district has minimum parcel sizes that are required. The other, or the other reason is for a change of uses that are allowed. So in this case, I could go from A1 to residential because I want to uh, cut off a parcel that's two acres and that's too small for ag zoning. Uh, the main criteria here is whether it's consistent with the comprehensive plan. We've all been hearing about comprehensive plans for about 15 years now. And this is where it really comes into play. Uh, we have an area that under the comprehensive plan is supposed to be business and somebody wants to change it to residential. Is it consistent with the comprehensive plan? And consistent is a intentionally vague term. That's straight out of state statutes. Doesn't have to match identical. It doesn't, and, and you'll see there's not a lot of matching between the comprehensive plan and the zoning ordinances. And that was intentional. It's just consistent, broad terms. Uh, and then once it's changed, Anything that is, was, is allowed in that new district is now allowed on that property if it goes through the whole process and approved. You cannot put conditions on a rezoning. So the process for special exceptions, conditional uses and variances. First, uh, first step is they would apply to our office by the end of the month. Uh, so let's just say they, they came to us at the end of December 
got us the application. At that point, as soon as we get it, we email it out to the town clerk that um, in whatever town they're in. The applicant would contact you. It's their responsibility to contact the town board and ask to be put on the agenda. Some towns require that, some towns have a plan commission and have them go to that for certain things, for everything. Some towns don't have a plan commission. Uh, so for the special exception, conditional use and variance, the town decision is advisory. Um, somebody wants to, like I said before, they can only be eight feet from the property line, go to the town, the town says, well, yeah, we don't really see a problem with that. It's not a binding decision, but the respective board gives that a lot of weight, whether it's the board of adjustment or the zoning committee. Uh, the town doesn't have to have a public hearing. The state statutes are very clear that the public hearing is held at the zoning committee or on the county level. Um, if a town chooses to have a public hearing, that's their choice for rezones. A town denial is binding and a town approval is not. Uh, town approval is a, is a recommendation. If the town denies it, there sets in motion this whole process laid out in the state statutes. The, the town would file a certified resolution of disapproval with the county. At that point, when it goes to the zoning committee, the zoning committee only has two options, either deny the application or approve it with changes. They can't just approve it as originally presented because the town did that filing of the certified resolution. If, it, if the committee approves it, uh, they change it and then approve it, goes to the county board, the county board has would act on it. If they were to approve it, the town then has 10 days to act on that decision. If the town says, well, yeah, you changed it, but we still don't like it. Town board could have another meeting, vote it, or vote it down, file another type of certified resolution, and that ends the process and the rezoning is done. So in a rezoning, the town has a ton of weight on the denial side. On the approval side, the town could say, oh yeah, we think it's a great idea. Then it gets to the zoning committee and they could turn it down if they so chose. Like I said before, the committee does give a lot of weight to what the town says though. So when it, when somebody does apply, one of the first things we, well, about a week later, one of the first things we do is we publish a public hearing notice, has to run for two weeks, and the last notice has to be at least seven days prior to the meeting. Uh, that's why sometimes you'll hear people talk about how long this takes, you know, it's about a two month process. Well, that's one of the big reasons. Uh, we also notify all the property owners within 300 feet of the property, uh, not just if the house is within 300 feet, we take the perimeter of the property and any property lines that touch that, get a notice. At the public hearing, anybody in the world can speak their opinion one way or the other. It's not, um, it, it, it's, it's commentary. It, it, the committees take that into consideration. It's not binding, the, the uh, neighbors don't all have to vote on it and agree to it or anything like that, but the committee gives it a lot of weight. Uh, the, the committee and the Board of Adjustment had the ultimate vote. The neighbors, like I said, don't have to agree. The Board of Adjustment and the committee's decisions are final on conditional uses, special exceptions, and variances. When it comes to rezoning, that's actually, a, you're changing the law. The ordinance says what it says. The map that says this property is residential is part of the law. So the full county board has to act on that to change that law from this map showing this to be residential to something else. Example rezone timeline, you apply by the end of March, go to the town board in April, the zoning committee holds the public hearing on the first Wednesday of May, and then the county board would vote on it in the third Tuesday of May. So the next, all that information we just went through is all in that public administration or zoning administration ordinance. Uh, under comprehensive zoning, that's, that's one of our more robust ordinances. 
It's about 100, 110 pages. Great reading. I'm not sure why it never made it onto the New York Times bestsellers list. Uh, it is a county choice whether or not to have comprehensive zoning. In order for it to be in effect in a town, the town has to make that choice. We want county zoning. Once a town adopts county zoning, they're in until a comprehensive revision of the zoning ordinance occurs. Uh, there's no state basis for the ordinance. There's some state statutes that regulate certain aspects of it if you have it in your ordinance, but there is no model ordinance on the state level saying this is what zoning should look like. Uh, it's, it's, it's a very local, it, zoning is a very local thing. You have to tailor to what's, what affects you. Regulations, this talks about allowable uses, sizes of lots, uh, setbacks where you can do certain things, CAFOs lot, and lot sizes. So the zoning ordinance is actually laid out pretty logically once you get used to reading ordinances. And it starts with all the general provisions. These apply any place that the zoning ordinance applies. And once you get done with the general provisions, a lot of times that's where your camping regulations are, um, some of the, the temporary uses, stuff like that. Then it gets into the individual districts. Once you fall into that district, here's the other regulations that apply. And then there's a whole section on definitions and definitions are a, a crucial part of it. Um, if something is defined in, the, defined in the ordinance, that's the definition you have to use. If it's not in the definitions, you have to use the state or the, the standard definition of that word. So under general provisions, you have uses. Uh, accessory buildings can't be first in residential zoning. That's a, that's a big one that we come up with or that comes up in our office. Uh, what the minimum dwelling size is, 720 square feet, uh, whether you can use semi-trailers as storage. Those are all under general provisions. No matter what your zoning district is, those things apply setbacks from easements, um, heights of buildings. It, it touches on it and then it does get a little more specific in each district also. And then also the camping requirements. So this is an excerpt from the ordinance under R1, which is one of our more common districts. On the left, you'll see all, all the permitted uses allowed in R1. Those are things you can do as long as you meet the setbacks, generally don't have to go to any special meeting. You come to me and say, want to build a house? Staff looks at, it, yeah, okay, you meet the sanitary ordinance, you meet the setbacks, here's your permit. Once you move to the right side, that's the conditional uses. That's what I was talking about before is that, okay, they're not really out of line, but we need to take a special or a little closer look at that. Let the town have a kick at the cat. The zoning <coughs> committee have a, you know, a look at it. Uh, maybe put some conditions on, or uh, we did have an example under number three last year. Um, you'll see the second one there says commercial swimming pools. We did have somebody apply for a um, clothing optional commercial swimming pool. So they, they applied, went to the, uh, the local board or the local town. Uh, the town was not super excited about it. The application ended up getting withdrawn because they didn't feel they could, um, it wasn't what they wanted to do. They, they tried to change their plans. They scaled it back. And then they came back and ended up getting voted down at, with the, they, they got rid of the clothing optional portion. Um, but the, the town was still against it and the committee gave that a lot of weight. So then R1 also goes into prohibited uses, which is very odd in a zoning ordinance. Uh, I wanna say Adams County is probably the only one that actually has prohibited uses listed in a district. Uh, and it's one of the more confusing sections. And I do get into more detail on number one at the end of the presentation. But it does also regulate height, setbacks, lot lines, and roads, and ground coverage. Um, livestock clarification, that'll come at the end. 
there's the other districts that we have in, in zoning. Anything with A is, is generally an agricultural district. Ours are your residential. And then you get into business, industrial, PRs, planned residential, similar to residential, just souped up a lot of times more for like um, creating a, a mixed use area. You have a lot of houses and then maybe a couple of stores, right? Mixed in or think like a little town. And then PSP is, is a lot of where the town halls are, is the most common one. Then we have overlay districts. So you have your basic districts, which I just talked about, those, those regulate various uses. Then we have overlay districts. Uh, wetlands would be another, a good one. Wetlands can be in any district. So your property could be zoned R1, you still have that wetland overlay district. Certain things can happen in that wetland overlay area. Again, if there's two ordinances or two sets of regulations that apply, the more restrictive always wins. Legal non-conforming under comprehensive zoning. So it can be a use or a structure. Uh, the most legal non-conforming use or legal non-conforming structure is the, is the official term. Most people know it as grandfathered in. Uh, the key part of this whole thing though is legal. So if somebody builds something, even though it's there when we identify it, if it wasn't put there legally, it doesn't make it a legal non-conforming use or structure. Um, this is more in the case of, let's go back to say the town of Monroe. Uh, 2015, somebody built something five feet from their property. They adopted zoning. The ordinance says you have to be 10 feet from your property. That is a legal non-conforming structure. It's too close to the line, but it was put there legally under whatever rules were at the time. Then they adopted zoning, rules changed. We don't go back and make them move it or anything else, but there are certain restrictions that do get put on it. Um, if a non-conforming structure is damaged, destroyed by violent wind, vandalism, fire, flood, ice, snow, mold, or infestation, infestation after 2006, it can be restored to the exact same size, location, and use that had immediately prior. Um, doesn't matter how much it costs, the whole 50%. That's like a thing I've heard for many years. You don't have to leave a wall or anything else. This tree falls on my house. I can tear that house down and rebuild. Five feet from the property line. Doesn't matter. If a non-conforming use cannot be, or excuse me, a non-conforming use cannot be expanded or changed. And if it's discontinued for a year, it can't be restarted. Use versus structure. Structures. House too close to the road. Uh, I said 720 square feet is the minimum lot size, or excuse me, house size. Say they have a 600 square foot house, that would be a non-conforming structure. Uh, if there's a garage in residential zoning, they haven't gone through any special processes, it's just been there for 30 years, that's a legal non-conforming structure. Uses, mobile homes are a use. Uh, camping, businesses in the wrong district, farm animals, like say in residential, or too many dogs. Farmland preservation, uh, that's, it's, it's talked about or, or it's predicated on the comprehensive zoning ordinance. Farmland preservation does not relate to property taxes in any way, shape or form. It's a program to provide for income tax rebates or cre credits for having additional restrictions placed on your property. One of our zoning districts, uh, it's called A135 with farmland preservation overlay. It's a very specific district that was written by the state. It meets their requirements. In order to be eligible to claim the farmland tax credit on your income taxes, you have to be in that district. Uh, you also have to be a farm and $6,000 of revenue a year or $18,000 over the course of three years to be considered a farm. Uh, and then you also have to have a compliant nutrient management plan, um, which our land and water they'll issue a certificate certificate of compliance uh, that you that you meet the conservation standards. It's not a program you enroll in. You're not getting any tax break on on property taxes. Uh, you can be compliant with everything, choose to take the income tax credit this year and not take it next year. 
kind of jump in and out. The biggest, the biggest thing with farmland preservation, the, the restriction you're giving up is the only time you can build a house if you're zoned exclusive ag with farmland preservation is if you're a farmer or a parent or a kid of a farmer on that property. So if I just wanted to sell you 40 acres and you don't have any intention of farming, you actually can't build a house on that property. That's the restriction that comes along with being able to take that income tax credit. So then we get into shoreland zoning. That is mandated by the state of Wisconsin. It has been around for about 50 some odd years now. For the first 45 years of that, it was a minimum ordinance. This is where everybody's heard of the 75 foot setback from water. Up until about seven years ago, we could be, uh, we could have said 150 feet to the water. It was minimal. You could go as over and above it as much as you wanted. Um, for the last six, almost seven years, it's now a minimum and maximum. 75 means 75. State set that, we cannot go more restrictive than that. Uh, by law, it has to and can only apply within a thousand feet of a lake or 300 feet of a navigable river, stream, or creek, or to the landward side of the floodplain. So occasionally you have a floodplain that'll extend a couple thousand feet from a river. Shoreland zoning actually encompasses that floodplain area also. Regulates setbacks, vegetation removal uses, just like any other zoning ordinance we've talked about. Land disturbing activities, uh, excavating, putting in beaches, uh, lot sizes, and then impervious surface. If it rains, where's the water going to go? So shoreline zoning is divided into five districts, shoreline wetland, rec res, rec res conservation, general purpose, and conservancy. In the wetland and conservancy districts, Virtually nothing can happen. Um, very minimal. There's a couple, uh, I think, a couple of non residential structures can be built in there. Uh, I think it's egg buildings. General purpose is similar to the B1, it's kind of our business district in Shoreland. And then Rec Res mainly allows homes. Rec Res also allows condos, but you have to have at least 20 acres to do a condo development. Uh, as far as rec res conservation, I don't believe we have any of that in the county. Ordinary high watermark. Uh, the point on the bank where the water is so constant as to leave a distinct mark. Water and wave action is so constant as to leave a distinct mark. Doesn't change from year to year. We're talking 20, 30 years. Few instances where the ordinary high watermark is set by elevation. Uh, Parker Lake is one example. <clears throat> Back in the 60s, they had to, um, there was a whole court case that went on and, and the court actually, consultation with the DNR, set an elevation of this many feet above sea level is the ordinary high water. That's what we regulate by. Generally, we go out to a site like what you see on the right. We have to establish where that ordinary high water mark is and then where 75 feet from that is. Love going out to these sites because that's that's pretty easy. I think most people in here would recognize that, you know, where that, that color changes on those rocks is pretty clear where it's constant enough, it, it left a distinct mark. These sites are not fun. Luckily, we don't have any of these. Uh, so you can see the, the stream going through the middle there. Question is, where is the ordinary high water mark on that? Back in the trees or at the edge of the trees. Uh, that's that's actually a dried lake bed, and it's a lot more common up north. So land disturbance. Areas that within 300 feet of the ordinary high water mark and drain to the water, those are the requirements. The, the big one we run into is it's flatter, but we need to grade it so we can mow or uh, we lost some shoreline because of the ordinary or extraordinary amount of water we got back in 2018. You can go up to 2,000 square feet. Don't have to go to any meetings. Our office can handle those requests. 
uh, less than a thousand if we're on a, a medium slope. Once you get on steep slopes, and I always say, you know, 20%, that's when you're getting winded walking up it. And you, you really can't do hardly any digging on that without going to the Board of Adjustment first for a special exception. So setbacks, exemptions. All structures have to be at least 75 feet from the water. We've been, that's been drilled in our head for decades, except boathouses, stairs, the Guard Gazebo Act, which comes up in a couple of slides, replacement of a structure that's too close to the water, setback averaging for a house or the lateral expansion of a non-conforming dwelling. So the lateral expansion, it was built 60 years ago, 50 feet from the water. You can expand it laterally. You can go up to 200 square feet total ever cumulative. You have to do mitigation. Uh, a lot of times that's your re restoring the buffer strip or removing uh, a shed that's too close to the water. <clears throat> Can't go any closer than the existing house. Boat houses, they are allowed. Here's all the requirements that's listed. That's cut and paste right out of the ordinance. Um, so there are a number of restrictions on boat houses. The big one is you have to have a pitched roof. So if you put in a new boat house, you can't have a flat roof and put a deck on top. Of it. But if you're interested, there's, there's a lot more regulation than that. Stairs, perfectly fine as long as they're necessary to access the lake. They do need to be above the water, or excuse me, above the ground by at least six inches. The, the bottom of the staircase or the underside of the staircase. And it talks about you can't put roofs over the stairway. You can have a couple of landings that are no more than 40 square feet and the stairs can't be more than five foot wide. The Guard Gazebo Act, been around since 1999. It allows for a 200 square foot structure between 35 and 75 feet from the wall. <coughs> called the Guard Gazebo, well, it's always been known as the Guard Gazebo Act. Think gazebo, open air. It can go down between the 35, 75. You have to do a full shoreline restoration, native vegetation, trees, shrubs, wildflowers from the shoreline, 35 feet in for the width of your lot. Uh, and if you already have a deck that's up by the house, but it happens to be 60 or only 70 feet from the water, that counts towards the total of your 200 square foot. So maybe you only get a hundred square foot gazebo. Replacing a structure. Any structure legally placed that is too close to the ordinary high water mark can be replaced. Doesn't matter the reason, doesn't matter any other setbacks. You can tear it down, start over from scratch in the exact same location and the exact same size. However, you can go up. Setback averaging. Uh, well, as far as I've been here three and a half years, we have yet to use, have a situation where this has come up. Um, but basically if the neighbors are closer, there's certain requirements that need to be met. I could reduce my house from 75 feet to whatever the average of my two neighbors are. And there's some stuff built in depending on if maybe there's one's closer, one's not what you can do. And the only thing that works for is the primary structure, meaning the house not the associated deck or garage or anything like that. Impervious surface. Definition, any surface that does not allow water to be absorbed into the ground. Um, for the most part in the shoreland areas, that's everything we're talking about right now. You can't go over 15% of your total lot. And that includes your, any of your roofs, obviously house, garage, um, Concrete sidewalks, blacktop driveway, those all, all count towards that. If you go over 15%, now we either get into doing mitigation or figuring out a way to treat that water to make sure it drains internally. Vegetation. As I said before, anything from the water's at or ordinary high water mark, 35 feet in, is considered the buffer zone. It's a very protected area on shoreline or on waterfront properties, for the most part, vegetation can't be removed except dead disease, they're dying trees and you have to replace it with something similar. It doesn't have to be the same size, the noxious weeds. And when you replace it, it should be a native species. Uh, outside the ve vegetated buffer zone, 
fair game. Uh, we, we don't regulate that in our ordinance. Uh, in, the, in the buffer zone, you can, you do have your access corridor. It's 35, 35% width of your lot. So if your lot's 100 feet wide, you can go 35 feet wide on your buffer strip or access corridor, excuse me. You still have to have some type of vegetation in there for ground cover, but you could remove the trees and shrubs so you can walk down to the lake. But you still have to have the ground cover, which means no beaches. And I got ahead of myself. So viewing corridor, 35 feet for each 100 feet of frontage is how the, or the state statutes are written. Uh, generally, it's interpreted to mean 35%. Does have to be perpendicular to the waterfront. And so for the last, say, 40 years, you've been mowing down to the water's edge. It's a legal non-conforming use. So why? Because a, a beach is a legal non-conforming use. I can't, it's no different than the structure. I said it was 20 feet from the water. Don't want to, can't make you come back and move that. Floodplain zoning. This is mandated by FEMA and the DNR. Um, and I put in there sort of. It's not that we have to have it. But if we want any of our citizens to be able to obtain a mortgage on a property in the floodplain, we have to have it. And anybody who already has a mortgage in the floodplain, if we were to get kicked out of the floodplain, the NFIP, their mortgages become delinquent, immediately come due. So it, it, it's really crucial that on the floodplain ordinance, and we get audited every year by the DNR, or excuse me, by FEMA, uh, to make sure that we are following certain stand, the what the ordinance says. Um, if we don't, we can go on probation, and then we can get kicked out of the program. The it does regulate the allowable uses, development standards. There are no setbacks in the floodplain ordinance, and it applies only in the unincorporated areas of Adams County that are mapped by FEMA as floodplain. On the map on the right, well, I don't know why that eight's there, but anything in the orange, brown, whatever color you want, is the mapped areas of the floodplain of Adams County. It is our most technically advanced ordinance we enforce. Uh, way too many details to even talk about. A few general ideas to remember. FEMA created the maps that show where they believe water will cover in the event of a flooding situation. The 100 year floodplain is actually not an accurate term. It's the 1% or er, yeah, the 1% flood. Any given year, there's a 1% chance that it can happen this year. You say 100 year flood, you think, okay, well, I had it this year. I'm good for 100 years. I've seen the same area get flooded at the 100 year flood, 100 year flood, twice in four years. So it's any given year has a 1% chance of it happening. Usually based on rainfall in the drainage area. If a dam is upstream, it's also, they calculate the, uh, the floodplain based on you have a lake or reservoir, whatever, holding back that water, held back by a dam. And then you snap your fingers and the dam's just gone and all that water rushes out. Anything that the water's gonna cover that FEMA believes the water is going to cover if that dam disappears, is regulated as a floodplain or is mapped as the floodplain. It's an elevation, uh, 807 feet above sea level. You can take that any place. Every floodplain is different. As you move downstream on a waterway, the floodplain decreases. The kicker in the floodplain ordinance is if FEMA says you're in the floodplain, you're in. I don't have a say, nobody. Nobody in this room has a say on whether you're in the floodplain or not. As a property owner, you can take steps to prove that you're not in the floodplain, and that involves hiring a surveyor. And then, well, okay, I expand on that another slide or two. One of the things that does come up quite a bit is ordinary high watermark versus the floodplain. The floodplain or the ordinary watermark, generally the water gets there every year. 
it was so constant as to leave that distinct line on that on those rocks. Then we have the floodplain. That's extraordinary events. Two thousand, you know, August of two thousand eighteen. That's what we're talking about in the floodplain. Oops. So then we get into districts, just like any zoning ordinance that does have different districts. You have zone X, A, A, E. A, E is further broke down into flood fringe, floodway. So zone X, you're not mapped in the floodplain. This ordinance does not exist as far as you're concerned. In zone X, you can still get flood insurance and it's substantially cheaper than flood insurance if you're actually in the floodplain. A uh, friend of mine in that 2018, he was up on a hill uh, in the middle of a pit cornfield when the rain hit, or the cornfield when the rain hit, and the water came down off his, the hillside with so much force it caved in his basement. He didn't have floodplain. He wasn't mapped in the floodplain. And as everybody knows, flood damage isn't covered by your homeowner's insurance. Um, so he ended up tearing the house down and having to rebuild. Uh, luckily he, I mean, in his case, he inherited the house, so he didn't have a mortgage on it. Um, so he was able to do that. Zone A, FEMA, based on the best available information they have, uh, topo maps, aerial photos, wetland maps, they believe at the time of flood, this is where the water is going to be. They, they don't know what that elevation above sea level is. And it's on the, and they marked, they basically say how far out they think the water is going to go. Zone E, zone AE, they've actually done engineered studies or somebody's done engineered studies and FEMA's accepted them and they've established that elevation. You can then take that elevation to all the land near the waterway and know exactly where that water should go at the time of a hundred year flood. The issue is the maps they is that they created use 10 foot contour lines. So if you hit one contour line and you're a foot higher than that, it actually bumps you up into that next contour line up, which means you're probably nine, you could be up to nine feet above the floodplain, but based on how they did, FEMA did the maps, that's where you're at. Flood fringe. At the time of flooding, this is where the water is going to be sitting. Think of it as a, a storage area for too much water. Floodway, when it floods, that water is moving. And the amount of force that floods have is astronomical. So what's allowed where uh, under zone A? Zone A, no homes. Egg buildings, yes, and they're pretty much allowed any place. There's a number, there's certain restrictions that do apply to them to make sure that they don't end up at a time of flood, they don't end up a mile downstream. Uh, most uses you can do as long as they're kind of open air uses. Boathouses, we have to allow those. Decks, up to 200 square feet. And then filling, the big thing there is you can't increase the base flood elevation. So if, if I dump a bunch of truckloads of dirt or soil in my yard, that's area that the water can't sit at the time of a flood, which means all my neighbors, the water's going to, the flood's even going to be worse. So that's built into the ordinance that you can't cause that flood elevation to increase. And why is zone A bad? We have to regulate the same as a floodway, which means basically you can't do anything. Um, because we don't have enough if, info. We don't know if it's floodway, flood fringe, um, exactly where that water is going to get or how deep the water is going to be on your property. <laughs> Lomas, this is what I was talking about. FEMA says you're in, you're in until you prove otherwise. So you hire a surveyor, they go out, shoot elevations. Oh yeah, you're, you're nine feet higher than what they say the flood elevation is going to be. You send that information off to, to FEMA. They issue what's called a letter of map amendment. It's their way of saying, oops. So here you can continue doing what you want, or you can build your house because we are wrong. You actually aren't in the, in the flood. <coughs> Insurance. This is what I was talking about with getting kicked out of the NFIP, the National Flood Insurance Program. Every federally backed mortgage for structures in a floodplain 
must have flood insurance. That is a federal law. So between flood insurance is about $2,000 to $6,000 a year. Aloma removes this requirement. You had the surveyor do the work, shows you're higher than the floodplain. You no longer, you're not in the floodplain. You no longer need to have a um, flood insurance. Still not a bad idea, but it's no longer a requirement. Anyone can purchase the flood insurance. Like I said, if, even if you're in zone X, that's fine. You can do that. It's a federally mandated price. Shopping around doesn't help. Flood fringe construction standards. You can build a house. It has to be unfilled. The fill has to be one foot higher than whatever the flood elevation is. And the first floor of the house has to be another foot higher than that. Um, and the perimeter of that fill has to be, you have to 15 foot buffer around the house. And you can't cause a rise in the BFE. So you're getting an engineer involved to demonstrate that, yep, I'm gonna put this fill in here, but the floodplain is big enough that even if we get that, it doesn't affect anything. You can put in detached accessory buildings. The first floor of it has to be at the flood elevation. It doesn't have to be on the fill. And then all the mechanicals have to be at least two foot higher. So we're not causing electrical issues when we do get flooding. Now on to cell towers. Uh, it's a county choice, but if we adopt, basically it's the state and federal, they set the requirements. Uh, applies in areas that under shoreland, floodplain, and comprehensive zoning. And it regulates height, setbacks, and when they're allowed. Um, local governments, including county, have virtually no control over cell towers and they do require conditional use permit. Uh, we, in the zone towns, we have not issued a permit for a new cell tower since I've been here. Um, and in 24 years, I've seen quite a few. There was a big push in the early 2000s for, for new towers going up. At this point, most companies try to co-locate if they can. Substantially cheaper for them to put another antenna on an existing tower than to go through the trouble of paying for a new tower to be built and the, the legacy costs of that. Uh, this is what basically all of our permits are when it comes to cell towers. It uh, doesn't require any permits and it's whether they're adding another satellite or replacing it out, they would need to get that permit. Septics or sewers and sewage disposal. This is our septic system ordinance. It is required by da uh, DSPS on the state level. It is a minimum and maximum ordinance. Whatever the state regulations say is what we have to do. Uh, it does apply countywide, doesn't matter incorporated area, unincorporated area. Uh, regulates septic systems, privies, fancy name for outhouses, uh, porta potties, RV transfer containers, and then non plumbing sanitation system. Think uh, compost toilets. It regulates how septic systems and similar things are installed, maintained. Uh, it, it's based on the administrative codes, state administrative codes. The three-year pumping maintenance requirement where you get a notice every three years saying it's time to have your septic system pumped out or inspected is housed in this ordinance. And then what you need for a permit is also spelled out here. This is our schedule for how we send out maintenance notices for that three-year cycle. Uh, there's a lot of information there, but basically you get about nine months to fully comply, but you do get about three notices over that time. And that's when the citations can start happening. Number of bedrooms. So the state sanitary code allows for sizing all septic systems three ways. Number of bedrooms, which is about 99% of our systems are sized that way. I have a three bedroom house. That's what we're going to do uh, per capita two people per bedroom. That's how a lot of these calculations occur. If you use anything other than the first one, you do have to file an affidavit saying no more than four people will ever occupy this house. That gets filed with your deed, shows up in the title search, causes a lot of issues down the road. You, and I've never had anybody do actual water flow where you put a water meter on or you, somehow you know, yep, we use exactly 23 gallons a day. You can base it on that. If it goes up, you have to increase the size of your septic system. Then we get into 335, which is the tourist rooming house. Uh, it is a county choice. There is no state 
basis for this ordinance. Currently, it does apply in all the unincorporated areas of the county, except for the town of Lincoln and the town of Rome. Uh, they have their own ordinances regulating tourist rooming houses. It regulates occupancy, uh, the safety measures necessary, and then the whole licensing process. Overview, uh, chapter, state statute 66, 1014 to A. Uh, subject to paragraph D, a political subdivision may not enact or enforce an ordinance that prohibits the rental of a residential dwelling for seven consecutive days or long. What that means is any place in the state of Wisconsin where a house is allowed, they have to be allowed to rent it out. So next best thing is regulate it in terms of making sure that it's done safely, doesn't, isn't detrimental to the neighborhood. Uh, so anybody renting their house to someone for 29 days or less is where this applies. If you get to 30 days, this ordinance doesn't apply. That's more like say a year lease type situation. Campgrounds, bed and breakfasts and hotels are not covered under this ordinance. They have their own state licensing requirements and state regulations. And then uh, for tourist rooming houses, you do have to have a, a state health department license, which is in our case issued by Wood County. And we currently have about 200 of them, not including the areas that this ordinance doesn't apply to. Then we get into building construction. Um, county choice, mostly. Um, if we adopt it, can't be more restrictive than the UDC, which is the Uniform Dwelling Code, or the CB, CDC, CBC, the Commercial Building Code. Uh, it applies in any municipality that delegates Adams County to do the inspections for them. Uh, currently all of our zone, all the towns under county zoning, uh, we do the building inspections for, and then the town of Big Flats also has, uh, they do their own zoning, but they did hire us to do their uniform uh, building code inspections. Regulates how the dwelling is constructed and the structures associated with the dwelling. So the deck that comes out of there, uh, doesn't regulate setbacks, uh, doesn't regulate uses, saying whether or not it's allowed. It's more, if you're doing this, this is how you have to build something or do certain things. Doesn't regulate height, size, if you can build. Doesn't directly regulate dilapidated houses either. Doesn't regulate what can be built, only how. Exist to incorporate the, this ordinance is, exists. It's a small ordinance. Primary thing it does is references the state code and says, here's when you have to do it. Read this code, that's the requirements that, that apply. Uh, doesn't really in there specify how anything has, you know, that you have to have certain, any certain requirement you won't find in this ordinance, that's the state code. Uh, establishes building permit expirations and inspection times. So what needs a building permit? Uh, anything that has anything to do with a non-HUD home, decks attached to a house, or decks even if they're not attached, if you can access them from the house. Uh, one and two family dwellings, multifamily dwellings, commercial structures, you go right on electrical service, like say for a camper, and then when you start converting the build, the use of a building, this would kick in also. What doesn't need a permit? Accessory building is not attached or serving as an exit to the home. Um, so uh, if I have a, a camper on my property and I put a deck next to it, I don't have a house there, that doesn't need a building permit because it's not associated with a single family dwelling. Shingling provided that, provided less than two courses exist, and ordinary maintenance repair, put new siding on, swap doors out, exact same size, location, uh, as long as you're not messing with the structural members. So some miscellaneous stuff. Uh, land use and structures are generally reg regulated by the previous ordinances as we've gone over. Uh, other things come into play in our day-to-day -day work through. Um, so farmland preservation, Kind of talked about that. It's located in the comprehensive zoning ordinance. It's save some farmland by development or from development by offering a financial incentive to farmers. Um, the biggest thing is houses aren't allowed except for a farmer. 
you can jump in and out. Um, which is accurate. You can jump in and out of whether or not you take the tax credit. You can't jump in and out of whether you're zoned exclusive ag. So um, if you're, and then there's also a corresponding farmland preservation plan that exists and that has certain areas mapped as farmland preservation. You overlay that with comprehensive zoning and that's how you get to this. That's the part you can't really jump in and out of. You can choose whether or not to take the credits any given year. And for, in case you're curious, uh, it's $7.50 an acre every year, income tax credit. And it's a credit, not a deduction. So comprehensive planning, talked about that a little bit before. It's not a law, it's not an ordinance. It's, it's a guiding document. This is where, you know, and there was a lot of meetings, like I said, 15 some odd years ago. Um, as, a, as a resident of the community, or a leader of the community, you think, okay, where, where do I see the community going in 20 years? Where do I want it to be? Oh, we, oh, it'd be great if we had all of our businesses over here and, and that's what we're gonna focus. And, and we have our fire, all of our emergency services over here. So it makes sense to kind of put the, uh, the residential over by those and, and the schools just around the corner too. Uh, it's updated every 10 years. And there is a lot more to it than just land use. There's also natural resources. There's also natural resources. There's nine components to a comprehensive plan. Um, updated every 10 years. The last time Adams County did it was 2017. So we got that on the horizon in the next four years. Uh, the biggest thing is all land use decisions must be consistent with the comprehensive plan. Uh, specifically, what it needs to be consistent with is the future land use plan. And that's where we talked about before when, you, when a town goes through and somebody applies for a rezoning, that's where this would come into play. Um, and consistent, like I said before, is intentionally vague. So violations come up on a regular basis. There's two main available processes we have. Uh, both start the same. First letter, nice. Hey, appears you're in violation. Give me a call within 10 days so we can discuss this. Uh, if we don't get a response, then we send a second letter. It's, it's a little more formal. It has code language in there. And at that point, it's usually you have 30 days to correct it. Um, if no compliance, then we can write a citation. Uh, and we do have citation authority. We use them as a last resort uh, outside of, if you, if you take out the septic system pumping citations, I would say we average 10 a year, 10 citations. It is. And that's after numerous letters, numerous phone calls. Um, it, it really is a, a last resort. Um, the thing with the citation, interestingly, is it's only a monetary penalty. So let's, uh, for example, somebody has um, 10 unlicensed vehicles on their property. And we write them, we've written a bunch of letters. We write them a citation, goes to court, and the judge says, guilty. All that says is you owe the $200, $200.50, which is what the citation usually is. Doesn't say you have to get rid of them. It's just, yep, you were guilty on that day. You owe $200. So uh, technically each day those cars are out there is a new violation. And we could write a new citation every day. In practice, that's not how it works. Uh, you, you go through court. Maybe they pay the citation. Maybe they plead no kind. Once the court part's done, then we move into... Do we write another citation? Uh, and, and that changes from situation to situation, depending on um, willingness to comply, if they're making an effort, if any number of factors. So the other option is long form summons and complaint. This is, um, I use it for the more serious violations and we can basically ask for any penalty we want. Uh, recently, we did have a situation where a gentleman was tearing apart mobile homes. Uh, he had four on the property in various states of disrepair, and there was a lot of other stuff on there. We actually went to court, 
Uh, he wasn't in compliance. And this is, we started the court action about a year after I first started talking to him and he was not complying in any way. Went to court and the court granted us the, the penalty we, we requested was to allow our department or whoever we hired to go in and clean it up for him and place it on his taxes. Uh, the court did grant that and we could have gone in about three months ago. And however, he was making the day after court, all of a sudden he really wanted to comply. He wanted to take care of it himself. And I've given him time to do that. And now he's stopped progress. So we will need to actually execute that, um, that judgment. And it takes time to go through that. About, I mean, I've seen it up now uh, probably even longer than the two years. Who makes that determination and what basis do you have that you're consistent with other things if that's his only means of income? So jot that down and we'll do that during the question part. All right, so example number one, uh, we're, we are actually nearing the end here. Uh, so example number one, this owner requests where the arrow is to build a house on the following property. Can he? Uh, it is the same property on both different levels. This is shoreland zoning, the yellow recre recreational residential. This yellow is R1 residential large lot. Um, so in this case, the answer is yes, because in both those districts, shoreland and or rec res under shoreland and then residential under comprehensive both allow for single family dwellings. Now we just have to start talking about, okay, can you meet the setbacks and that kind of stuff. So this one's a little bit trickier. Uh, this gentleman wants, or this property owner uh, comes in and says, I want to put in a, uh, a boat repair business on this property. Uh, on the left is comprehensive zoning that's rec or, uh, excuse me, residential R1 and on the left is recreational residential same as the last slide it's very common mixed uh, pairing so can you put that business in there excerpt uh, this is the comprehensive zoning if you look in the permitted uses it's not listed at all under conditional uses it's also not listed. Under permitted uses in shoreland zoning, it is not listed. However, under special exceptions in shoreland zoning, it's listed something similar. Um, we can't possibly imagine every scenario, so you look for similar uses. So as of today, I'd have to say no, he can't do that. However, there is a process to go through to make it okay. Uh, the use isn't listed, as I said before. So what you would need to do is, oh, so what does he need to do? He'd have to apply to rezone the property under comprehensive zoning from R1 to business. In business, that's the permitted uses, customer item repairs. So, okay, that's, that sounds like what he wanted to do. Uh, so if he got rezoned to B1, that's now a permitted use that's allowed. Then he didn't need to apply to it for a special exception because that's where it was listed under shoreland zoning in that district. Both of those tracks have to play out and vote or be approved in order for him to do it. If either gets denied, it's done. Um, and they and as you're going through that process, other than on the reason, they can put conditions on. Hours of operation are only from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. You can only have six boat motors on the property at any given time. You can't put a sign on the property more than 10 square feet. Um, anything that's germane to the application. So example number three, we, we spent a fair amount of time on the floodplain part. Uh, so let's just say this is a vacant lot and the owner wants to build a house. Can he? What does he need to do to, to do it? Keep in mind that the orange is floodplain. Uh, it's and clicked here, so it's actually zone AE. Under general and standard, or shoreland, it's residential and rec res. So it's listed as AE, it's not in the floodway. 
So he can build under the floodplain ordinance. He has to fill at least the one foot above. First floor has to be two foot above the floodplain elevation. Um, there are some other things in there and he still has to have flood insurance. Just because he filled doesn't mean he's out of the floodplain. Or You'll notice, so the contour mapping here, the contour lines, there's about a 24 foot slope there from the water's edge to the top of the, or to the plateau of the property. So my suggestion to him, if he would come in, instead of going through the whole fill and elevation certificates, have a surveyor shoot the elevations, apply for a loan and get your property taken out of the floodplain. It, it ends up making his life a lot easier. If, he, if it's successful, then he no longer even has to have the flood insurance if he chooses not to. All right, so not every town in Adams County has county zoning. Uh, we have uh, the towns of Strong's Prairie, Big Flats, Quincy, and Rome all have their own, in Lincoln, all have their own zoning ordinances. And then the town of Leola has no zoning at all. They don't have town or county. So this property uh, wants to build another shed right there. Um, can they? This is in the town of Strong's Prairie. So my answer, our office's answer is, mm, don't know. Um, you need to contact the town of Strong's Prairie. They have their own zoning. We don't have any jurisdiction on that property. None of our rules apply. It's completely up to them. Final thoughts on ordinances and zoning. Our office is here to serve the customer and that includes all of you. Uh, we do this stuff every day. Uh, we always, we have to keep in our mind that the typical homeowner or property owner comes in, they build a house once, maybe twice in their life. Um, they, they don't deal with this on a regular basis. We do. Um, so if it, it, it's very common that they don't, there's a lot of component, everything we've gone through, you know, they don't know this, but that's part of our job is to make sure what they want to do fits in terms of the ordinance. We're not big on just flat out saying, no, you can't do it. It's, it's okay. Well, the way you're planning, this isn't going to work. Here's how we can make it happen. Um, and our job is to help them. Then we get into um, the whole process of revising the ordinance. So as I said before, if somebody applies for a rezoning, um, the town gets the first crack at it. If they turn it down, that puts limits on the, on the committee. More important, if that happens and it gets approved by the county board, the town has that veto authority to override that rezone. It's part of another paragraph or larger paragraph that actually says, if you revise a whole zoning ordinance or any text in a zoning ordinance that applies to more than one town, all the towns have to vote on it after it's passed by the county board. A majority have to approve it. Otherwise the ordinance doesn't take effect. Uh, so let's just say the committee votes on the revision, county board votes on the revision, goes out to the towns, uh, majority have to approve it. Otherwise, even though the county board approved it, it goes away. It doesn't exist. Then we move on to, so we're, we're done with zoning. And anybody want to take a break? Yeah. All right, let's take a break. Five minutes or whatever. This mm. meeting <clears throat> All right, um, so we'll get moving again. Uh, so we've kind of concentrated mostly on the zoning, uh, the zoning division side. Uh, I want to touch on some of the land and water programs here. Uh, the land and water division does quite a bit of things. Uh, you, the town members or as town board officials or plan commission officials, county board members, you are in contact with citizens a lot. There's a lot of programs out there that, that are, are Department does. Um, 
we one of the the efforts we've been making over the last couple of years or year, I guess, uh, is to is to really get the word out about some of these programs. So uh, the division is broke into a, a few different specialties, I guess the best way to put it. So under the water resource side, we do shoreline uh, site visits, looking at erosion issues, coming up with plans on how to make it better for or prevent the erosion or or reestablish it. Uh, healthy lakes and rivers, citizen lake monitoring network, where uh, we have citizens actually taking samples and keeping tabs on, on the conditions of the water in our, in our county. Uh, clean boats, clean water. For those of you who boat, you might have seen them at some of the boat landings where they're making sure that there's no aquatic invasive species on your boats. Uh, that's, that's a volunteer network that's spearheaded by, by our department, our division. Uh, and aquatic invasive species monitoring it goes beyond just clean boats, clean water. It, it's countywide. Uh, and then well testing, which started up in the last year. So, so far we've done three count or excuse me, three towns that have done the well testing. Those are the uh, top three across the county, uh, Leola, Rome and Monroe. Uh, this coming summer, we'll be doing four towns. The first 50 people or properties or wells in the, each given town, the well testing is covered. And then there's an educational component. If, if there's, we don't get the results uh, as far as like a bad one, the, the well owners are contacted. Uh, the gentleman from Stevens Point at the lab comes down and we, we set up a night. We do all the legwork for you and pay for it, but you still have to make the decision to get your water tested. Um, and the plan is, is over the years, we just keep rotating through three, four towns at a time, start back over at the, at the, at the north part of the county. Now, then we have the land resource programs, which is, is Carolyn's uh, specialty. Uh, we do have, we deal with grass waterways. Chuck more deals with that part of it, but nutrient management plans. Uh, if you remember, we talked about farmland preservation, nutrient management plans. That's where it comes into play. Uh, cover cropping, windbreaks, farmland preservation, cost sharing. Uh, cost sharing on a lot of the stuff that I listed above. Educational and other programs, uh, poster contests, which uh, will be coming out here, I think it's in the next week or two, uh, for voting by um, the general public. Uh, last year, we did have somebody go on to the national competition, correct? Yes. Uh, so there's, there's local, regional, state, national. Um, so I was excited. I never had that before. Uh, we do an outdoors day. Uh, it was held at the Rush Creek State. State Park last year, we had a number of volunteers put through about 100 kids. Uh, it, it was a great day. The kids got a lot out of it. Uh, we do a lot, some outreach in the schools and then the tree and shrub sale. Land and Water does have their own ordinances, uh, ag practices, manure storage, that types of stuff. Dam properties, Adams County owns nine dams. Uh, we, regulate, we regulate them, maintain them operate them uh there is a whole ordinance that actually regulates that non-metallic mining another area carolyn's specialty uh that's uh all your sand mines in the county if you're mining you need to have a reclamation plan um stormwater management runoff that kind of stuff and then the county forest plan which is also carolyn and that's our that's the newest ordinance out of all of these that was adopted last march So that's the land and water side. Uh, we have about six, seven more slides here, and then I'm going to turn it over to Carolyn. Uh, so I want to go over some of the, the common misconceptions that you run into with zoning. Uh, touched on this one already. Earlier, I said between the floodplain and the ordinary hot water mark. I described that. But we get a lot of calls where wetlands are confused with the other two also. And it makes sense. Well, wet, flood, you know, similar. Uh, so wetlands are delineated, defined and delineated by certain soil characteristics. Um, when I was a kid, I used to call it muck. Um, there, it's a little more technical than that. Uh, vegetation. What's the dominant vegetation right here? And the, the most obvious, there's, there's all your vegetation, plants, trees, all those can either be classified as basically always having to be on high ground, always having to be in low ground, and then there's a range in between. 
So the most common one that I guess always comes to my head is, is cattails. If you see cattails, you know it's wet or it's wet almost always. Uh, so what is the dominant vegetation? And then what are the water conditions? If I dig a hole any time of the year, and I go down 18 inches, am I gonna find free water or water in that hole? If two of the three of those are met, it is considered a wetland by the DNR. Floodplain is where the water covers during those extraordinary events like we had in 2018. And then the ordinary high water mark is, like I said, the point on the bank where the water and wave action is so constant as to leave that distinct mark. You can have any one of these without the others. Uh, wetlands don't have to be anywhere near a lake. You can have a, a pothole wetland out in the middle of nowhere. Doesn't have floodplain associated with it because it doesn't have navigable water, but it's, it's depression, it's low. Uh, and the ordinary high water mark, we have a number of lakes that have no floodplain associated with it. Generally, if the water, if it rains a lot, there's outlets um, and it, or it can't possibly rain enough to get above the banks. So another common misconception, and we get this call or email probably three, four times a week. Uh, how many acres do I need to build on in Adams County? Okay. The ordinance doesn't say you have to have a certain number of acres to build. Every zoning district has a minimum lot size requirement. Uh, for example, in A1 zoning, it's 35 acres. In R1 zoning, it's 20,000 square feet, so about a half acre. But it doesn't say you have to have 20,000 square feet to build on. What it says is if you're creating a new lot, you can't create a lot less than 20,000 square feet. So if I, 50 years ago, dad gave me 10 acres, it got zoned A1. Yeah, it's supposed to be 35 acres but it's 10, it was legally created, legal non-conforming parcel. I can use it for anything that the ordinance allows for. So if the ordinance says I can build a house, I can build a house even though I don't have the 35 acres. Now, if I had a 80 acre piece, I have to cut off at least 35 if I wanna cut off a parcel. So another common misconception, taxes and zoning. Um, Two unrelated worlds. They have nothing to do with each other. Uh, zoning prescribes what is allowed on a property. And it, it's, it's a pretty stagnant document that goes quite a ways into the future. Taxes are based on what's actually happening on the property. So uh, you, you can have a property that's zoned uh, residential. You can build a house on it, yes. It's zoned residential and it, for whatever reason, has a, uh, or it's all wooded. So you're being taxed probably as a productive forest. We don't have a district called productive forest, but that's how you're being taxed because that's what was actually on the property on January 1st of every year, or of the year. So this year you take out your permit, tear down some trees, go and build your house. Assessor goes out there on January 1st and says, oh, there's a house. Now it's residential. So. Your zoning didn't change. You, you've been R1 the whole time. But now the taxes are changing because you went from productive forest to residential. And then the following year, you decide, well, I'm going to tear the house down. I, it, wasn't, it wasn't what I wanted. And put in a, a cornfield. All right, you're still R1. Now you're going to be taxed as A. So your taxes can change as your use changes. And they, they'll even carve out if, if you have this part that's woods and, and you've probably seen on your tax bill where you might have three, four different lines. Uh, productive forest, three acres, residential, three acres, egg, 26 acres. They'll, they'll break a parcel apart to each of the individual uses. Um, and like I said, there we don't have a district called productive forest. Uh, also, we have the town of Leola, for example, that has no zoning. So not a single property out there has zoning other than shoreland areas, yet they still have property taxes. So somehow they're getting taxed even though there is nothing to do with zoning or there is no form of zoning there. So another common misconception, temporary versus permanent. Uh, we, we get this call on a, on a regular basis. Uh, oh, hey, we, we didn't need a permit for that because it's on skids. We, we can move it whenever, okay? Uh, the ordinance doesn't actually distinguish between temporary and permanent. And, and the thought process there is 
everything's movable, including your house. Um, so if, if we use that definition, can it be moved or that, that determination of whether it can be moved or not, well, everything is, and then by default, nothing needs a permit. Um, like I said, a shed on skids doesn't exempt it from the ordinance. Another one, MFL, managed forest law, versus zoning and farmland preservation because that kind of gets thrown into that mix also. Uh, so we have a number of people, uh, there's a lot of properties in Abs County that's in the MFL program. And when uh, a person, because that's a 20 year contract, we don't have anything to do with it, so I don't know the details, but I believe it's like a 20 year program or contract. A lot of times they'll, they'll set aside a two acre, yeah, someday I think I might want to build on that. Well, that didn't, none of that changes zoning. That didn't create a new, um, that two acres that you set aside in the MFL didn't create a new parcel. You still have your 80 acre piece. You just happen to set something up with the DNR that you held this part out of the MFL. Um, it's not a county program. It is administered strictly by the DNR. They notify us, or not us, uh, treasurer's office, and that's when they it, it, that affects your property taxes. And then MFL and farmland preservation are not related either. Farmland preservation, while silviculture, uh, farming trees is a important, important aspect, farmland preservation really does, most of our areas under that farmland preservation plan are ag fields, farms, that type of thing. MFL a lot of times handles the, the forested portions. Another, driveways. Our office doesn't handle driveways at all. If it's town road, we send them to you guys. Uh, if, it's, if it's county road, they go to the highway department. If it's state road, uh, Pat loves it, but I, I send them to the highway department also. And then he refers them on to the, the right person at the state level. Um, but on, from the zoning side, we have some setbacks from intersections and there's some language about signs that we deal with not so much driveways, but intersections again. But as far as whether you need a culvert, uh, how far they really should be from the intersection, we leave that up to you guys. So I mentioned this at the beginning, or towards the beginning about livestock. Livestock and farm animals, so your horses, cows, ducks, or turkeys, they're not allowed in R1 zoning. Doesn't matter the amount of acres. Now this has been something that's going around for a number of years. And under permitted uses, as I showed you before on R1, it says chickens are allowed. You can have five with no roosters. That's under permitted uses. You don't have to ask to do it. Just have your five chickens. Next section down under conditional uses, it says livestock other than what's permitted under the chicken section. So if you wanted to have livestock, you have to apply for a conditional use. Then in the prohibited section, it says under two acres, you can't have any livestock. Over two acres, you can have uh, one livestock unit per acre. However, at no point did it say it was permitted. So livestock is not permitted. Now, if you go to the conditional use and say, well, I have 10 acres zoned R1, I wanna have a horse or I wanna have 15 horses. That falls under that prohibited use if the board grants you a conditional use to, to have them at all. Board could say, say, well, yeah, we can approve eight. You have 10 acres, that's fine. The prohibited doesn't kick in or you're under that. And you've gone through the conditional use process, the town and the county have both looked at it. Everything, everybody's had a, had a, had a kick at the cat with that. And so, Thank you. Uh, so now we'll open up the questions and we'll start with the first one. I'm Al Arn from Preston Township. My question was on um, uh, income. If somebody in your example was tearing apart campers and he's my age and has a bad back, whatever, and he doesn't do it in a timely manner, but he's still taking them apart and that's his income, how are you regulating that to where you're consistent with every other business out there? Well, in, in the zoning ordinance, each district has permitted uses. Um, so in this case, it would be considered a salvage yard. They're, they're dismantling, whether it's campers or mobile homes. 
Um, we also have the definition of a junkyard. It could be either. So then you look, does that, or, does that district where that property is allow for those? If the answer is no, they can't do it. Um, had they been doing it 50 years ago before the ordinance, they've been doing it continuously, then yes, they can continue, that's fine. Um, but each district has certain allowable uses. So the question is, doesn't matter the time frame he's doing it in. The fact that he's essentially operating a business there is prohibited. But in your example, he was already doing it. He was uh, tearing them apart, but you were gonna have to go in and clean it up. Who regulates how messy or whatever is, where is there a consistency between what you think, what I think, and what Joe Smuckatelli down the street thinks? So the fact that he was doing it is the violation. I mean, you know, we, we have to start there. He did, and I said he had been doing it. He started about two years prior to me, uh, right? Well, years prior to me writing the first letter to him. Um, so it wasn't ever a legal, op or it wasn't ever a legal business. It start, so we're starting from the basis of it's illegal. I'm going to give him time to take care of himself. In this case, we did go to court. Um, actually, I did write a citation or two didn't get it cleaned up. Then we went to court and got the court order. Um, so the end result or the end goal is always compliance. Don't wanna punish people. I don't wanna unnecessarily charge them or write citations. And that's why I write as few as I do. Um, but in this case, the compliance had been going on and we finally had a court date, which takes quite a while. And that's how we ended up in that situation. So. It, it really is either a compliance or a not compliance. It, you know, it is, is the property compliant? If it's not, we have to take methods to make it compliant. If that answers your question. You, you went more in detail than what you gave originally. That's, that's what I'm saying. You're, yes. You're kind of, you were discussing this and now you brought in, is it, was it illegal to start with? That was it in your original conversation? I did not say that because I, asked, because I said it was a violation, that means it wasn't legal at any point. That, I mean, that's what made it the violation was he was operating a business. How hard is it, I guess this is probably more for the ladies, letters of non, of letters of non-compliance that you send out, how hard is it for those to be, copies of those to be emailed to the towns? <clears throat> I mean, if, if I, if I, you look all the name, file a complaint or I send an email to you that there's a, there's a problem as the clerk and the board has directed me to, I have the board asking me every single meeting, what happened, what's going on. I have no answers. I email you, if you were working on it, I'm just saying a copy of the letter. I understand giving them time. It's great. And, but. I can't remember every complaint or I don't know everything that you see. For example, you, you contacted somebody that had a building that they weren't supposed to have on Rustic Road for us. Mm -hmm. By the time we saw it, you had already contacted them to move it. So then I look like an idiot because I'm trying to contact them to move it before I file a complaint. Because a lot of times it's something as simple as getting over the window and saying, hey, uh, did you guys talk to planning and zoning about doing this? Because if you didn't, you're probably in non-compliance. I mean, we live in the townships. I'm I'm talking to these people. So I usually try and call them and say, you're in non-compliance. You need to contact planning and zoning. Because a lot of times you will do a back permit. You know, they don't have to rip the deck off if it can go through and get approved. They don't have to start over. Right. So, but I'm just saying if we don't know what all these compliance letters going out or what the follow-up is. Sure. So the, the follow or because we have so many different towns, um, and I would say in a typical week, my staff, between myself and my staff, we're writing 40 to 50 different violation letters at different because there can be one to 10 different letters depending on where we are at. Um, and to, to, and to send those out would be, uh, 
probably a logistical nightmare. However, when we create a violate or when we start a violation with a property, we create an entry in, in our internal database, um, which unimportant to all of you. But if you go online, it's there. It's still violation, unresolved, the date, and who, and actually it'll show which one of us is taking care of it. Does it show the township? Does it show? Well, it's that parcel. It goes by address. <clears throat> I'm more concerned about, like I said, they found something. I called somebody to tell them to go talk to them before they got in trouble with the county. And then I got yelled at because they already got in trouble with the county. And then the other one, we have the board asking me every single week what's going on with this, what's going on with this. Um. So let me share my screen again. And this time I'm going to share my whole screen. So as I said before, uh, and this is a really roundabout way, I'll get it'll, your answer will be incorporated in that. Um, one of my other divisions is the GIS uh, web mapping or GIS position. Uh, the map that you're not seeing. Rich. Um, okay. Hey, how about that? So this is a, this is online. This is available to to the entire world. Uh, all the different colors you see are different zoning districts. Um, these maps were created by the towns a number of years ago. If you go on here, you can see the, um, you, can, you can search by name, address, all kinds of good stuff. And as we get into, what? Is that better? Yeah. I mean, for the Zoom people? Okay. Um, so I was just going to show you the situation. So you can you can scroll, you can search, you can just find a property. Um, there is a property here. You're in you're in uh, the land records. You can get so you go to the county webpage. There's a link that says land records. Two blue boxes pop up, or greenish, blue, whatever. Uh, one is land records. That's not the, the mapping part. The other side is the, the web interface. You can get to the same place going either way. Um, but if you want to do it by map, that's how I always do it. But if you want to if you just plug in the parcel number, it works that way. So in this situation, here was a, you click on this property, go to link to GCS, more info. And so this is the specific property, town of Preston. Um, and you go to this permits tab. There's all the permits we've issued on that property. So you can see um, the third one down and about the seventh and eighth ones down. So we've had three different violations ongoing on that property. Um, and actually the 2019 one was a citation. Uh, that was a septic citation. But right here, the status is it's a resolved violation. Uh, when people apply for say a septic permit, it comes across the desk, gets logged into this, it'll say pending. You'd see that if you logged in. As it, it goes on my desk, I approve it. The status changes to approve. When I send it back to, to the front staff, they issue it, it says issue, the day it goes in the ground, status changes, system installed. So you can kind of follow along with all those. 
Now, in this case, if there's still an open violation, that would say unresolved violation. Um, so at that point, we that tells you whether there is a violation not going on on that property, or at least whether we've started to address it. Now, our office, once upon a time before I was uh, brought on, uh, operated on really a violate or a, a complaint only basis. That is no longer the case. It hasn't been for about three and a half years. Um, if my staff sees something that's not in terms or not in compliance with the ordinance, they address it. Um, so that's part of the reason why that, that happens where we've already addressed this issue. Um, and then you've contacted them again. Um, the easiest thing I would say is if the, if the town board is curious or call or email us and we'll respond like we did the other day, um, or I did the other day. Uh, otherwise, if somebody is complaining to the town board, my strong, strong suggestion is as a town board, don't take the complaint, just say, call us or call planning and zoning. Don't say me, I get enough calls. Um, our office, um, and we'll address it from there. Zoning violations take time to resolve. Um, and like I said before, it can take, I mean, I've had violations get resolved in two, three days and they can go out two, three years. Um, it depends on the situation, the, the, the process we go through, if it's through the court system, um, any number of different reasons. Other questions? Yeah, Jody. Um, I have a few, but I'll just take one and then circle around. May you send these slides to the attendees? Uh, no. What will happen will the, uh, there'll be a link on the county homepage that says, or whether we put, we'll put it on the homepage, homepage, right? At least for a while. So it'll be on the county website. Um, there'll be a link to the recorded portion of the presentation, which I believe will take you to YouTube, which is everything we're talking about now, or the actual hearing. There'll be a link right below that, that is for the whole, all the slides for the presentation. So that'll be available on the website. Yes, sir. We're very high water mark. Who determines this event? Our staff. Uh, when is as necessary. So, I mean, where it comes into play is we get out there and, and you want to build a, a deck on the front of your house, you're on the water. Well, we have to determine whether we, when somebody applies for a zoning permit to build anything, uh, you stake it out. My staff goes out and they make sure that it's in compliance as best we can with the terms of the ordinance. And if part of that determ is determining if we're too far, too close to the water, well, then we have to determine the ordinary high watermark, go out to the shore. Okay, well, there's a pretty distinct cut there. That's the ordinary high watermark, measure back to 75 feet. So it, it, it's usually as a as needed type basis. With respect to the high watermark, Jordan Lake, as you know, you know, got really high water flowed out of yeah. it. There were a lot of boat houses and stuff along the south shore of the lake that were probably two or three feet, uh, you know, water up on the sides of the houses and stuff. The people that own those, if they, uh, they're not going to be able to rebuild those now, will they? Because of the high water mark that came up recently, or will they be able to rebuild those if the lake goes back down somewhat? Sure. So, uh, great question. Um, I hope everybody at home heard that. Otherwise, uh, basically, there was a high water, the 2018 flooding event in, uh, in this specific case on Jordan Lake in town of Jackson. Uh, the lake rose about five feet, which put a lot of houses. And well, there was houses that the water was up next door to, or to the front door, to the wall. And um, then there was a, a number of sheds and boathouses and, and various things. There was one mobile home that was, or, yeah, it was, it was like a 1960s, early 60s, uh, that was underwater. So the question is, can they rebuild in that spot? Or uh, it's now, it was 2018. Uh, the, the water stayed at that level until this last summer. Always fluctuated a little bit. Uh, it's now dropped about, I'd say about two feet down-ish. Uh, as I said about an hour ago, um, the ordinary high water mark doesn't change. It, it's a long-term thing. So even though we've been at that level for about 
four or five years now, the ordinary high water mark is where it was before we got all that rain at the end of August in 2018. So in this situation, the ordinary high water mark is about 50 feet out in the lake. Uh, there was a new house built out there. If you drive by now on the boat, um, the house is about 40 feet to the water. However, I have very concrete evidence on that parcel. Um, the ordinary high water mark is another, he's actually about 100 feet from the ordinary high water mark. Um, so it didn't change. So as far as rebuilding, yes. Um, now, the, now the mobile home that was out there was removed uh, and they ended up putting in a boathouse as opposed to putting in a, uh, a mobile home or a replacement at home. Um, so they did, um, and they moved it back. So it, it did, uh, I, I think it did benefit the environment a little bit or benefit the lake in that situation. Uh, but no, the, the short answer is the ordinary high watermark hasn't changed on, on Jordan Lake. And it'll take another three, four, five years to get back to quote unquote normal. But um, and, I, and I've been in contact with the DNR and they're okay with me enforcing it that way. Parker Lake is another one exactly the same. Um, not quite as extreme, but so that's... <laughs> Yes, uh, and is there a place in the chapters that discuss the definitions describing a boat house, describing a barnuminium, addressing yurts, addressing campers, addressing RVs? I mean, is there definitions within the chapter that specifically define a boat house is white? Yes. Uh, a boathouse is defined under the shoreline zoning ordinance. And then more important, <clears throat> in the specific example of a boathouse, there is that whole section that says, has to be under 400 square feet, has to be uh, the, the long perpendicular parallel with the lake. The main door has to face the lake. You can have one service door 36 inches or less. Uh, you have to have a certain pitch rough you can't have a deck on top um oops sorry so every ordinance does have this definition section this is the shoreland one and we can that is the definition of a boathouse okay. uh, a, a permanent structure used for the storage of watercraft and associated materials and includes all structures which are totally enclosed have roofs or walls or any combination of these structural parts uh, so if you're storing your lawnmower in there, instantly it does not, it is no longer a boathouse and it becomes an illegal structure. It's for canoes, boats, water related stuff. So your fishing pole's fine. Um, life jackets, all that stuff. That's, that's what a boathouse is supposed to be. Um, once you start storing other stuff in there, that becomes a problem. Um, camping unit is defined in shoreland, general or comprehensive zoning and i believe i think there's also a definition for it in floodplain um specifically what is a camping unit and also mentions tents which i extrapolate to also mean yurts because it is essentially a, a glorified tent okay talking about floodplains about when you got a wooded area that's converted into agricultural what's the accountability for water runoff so floodplain and water runoff are two different things. Um, you know, we did have the situation, similar situation, 2018, big flats. You know, there was a lot of conversion of property over the last number of decades. And that's, that's true countywide. Um, ditches, everything else. Now you can have water sitting in an area that's not mapped as a floodplain. Um, and that was a lot of the case in big flats. A lot of those areas that were underwater aren't floodplain. Or, not, or they're not mapped that way. Uh, we don't regulate them that way. So it's whatever big flat zoning ordinance is, is the allowable uses. Now there is something we don't deal or we don't regulate on the state statute. The state statute says you can't cause water to run on your neighbor's property. It becomes a civil matter between the two of you and it's through the court system. And I would think that probably would be where that falls under. I like to talk about old 1970s where they penciled in those conservancies where that had the overlay of 
wetland, shoreland. Also, there was high ground <coughs> included in that. And I read about it, and that was for the purpose including uh, water, land, animals, and plants. And that also was for the pur purpose of including upland animals and habitat. And now it seems like we're all of our definitions seem to be directed towards water, land, shore, land, marsh, land, and, and this sort of an environment. Originally, this was set aside granted with a broad brush to include uplands also. And my point is, why do we want to approach, it seems like we're approaching this conservancy elimination <coughs> with an, another broad brush. <coughs> so and why can't the owners of existing conservancies maintain them as is, if they will to do so? All right, so I'm going to address part of that question. Um, the first part of that, it, you mentioned that there's there's conservancy districts. As I said, every every zoning ordinance is broken into different districts. You have just the conservancy district in shoreland zoning, but in comprehensive zoning, there's there's wetland conservancy, upland conservancy. Those districts also apply, not just in shoreland. Uh, so when you're you're referring to uh, that it's it's more geared towards the water side or you know shoreline cons conservancy, well that's what shoreline zoning focuses on because it only applies near water. However, there is still the whole um, conservancy district or upland conservancy in the comprehensive zoning, and that is the first part of what you said was. Uh, the upland areas, the wildlife, uh, scenic, special things we want to conserve. Um, that's that's in a, a different ordinance than the one that specifically re regulates water. Um, so I, I've been advised, and the reason I say I'm only answering part of his question um, is is that question is specifically the topic of a uh, proposed revision, as everybody knows. Um, and I've been to protect all you guys in quorum situations. We're not discussing that, um, so we're we're, we're mm -hmm. staying away from any of the questions that involve anything to do with any possible revisions occurring. So we we, we can talk about anything in the current ordinance. What do you what do you think about so that's part of the or usually when a district is created it says here's what the purpose is um here's the areas that it should apply in or you know why it's there um in the shoreland zoning ordinance um it that is one item that is lacking is is how it was created and, and specifically what it's for. If you look, most of the other districts have that. That district does not. Is this a district that's created for a tax advantage? Zoning and taxes have absolutely nothing to do with each other. So conservancy district, my understanding of the way it was originally created, um, it's in the current zoning ordinance, so we can discuss it. Came about early 1970s. And it was, I believe, the DNR that created these maps. And it was the idea of, let's cover all the areas that are floodplain, wetland, make a conservancy district, because none of those other districts, things existed. We didn't have a floodplain ordinance, uh, what I say, 1980? 1980? Um, we didn't have a floodplain ordinance. We didn't have a wetland district. So the DNR and, and Adams County felt it was important to protect those areas anyway. So we created the conservancy district put that in the shoreland zoning ordinance and that's how that came about. Since that time, other districts or ordinances have duplicated regulation in those areas. Um, but you are correct. One thing that is missing in that is, is the actual purpose, but that's the backstory on it. As far as tax 
Zoning and taxes have nothing to do with each other. Uh, essentially what it is, is it's, it's an area that back then they felt you shouldn't build in, whether they, it was to protect an area, to stay out of a floodplain or stay out of a wetland or not build on top of um, ship rock. You know, that, that would be why the Conservancy District existed. So are these districts managed publicly or privately? Say that again? Are these Conservancy Districts managed publicly or privately? Sure, so our office enforces it. It's part of a zoning district or a zoning ordinance. The, the best way to look at a Conservancy District, it's exactly the same as ag zoning. Ag says you can do this, this, and this. If you want to do something, our office is responsible for making sure it's in compliance. That property just happens to be zoned conservancy. It has its own listed uses and what's allowed, what's not. Our office has to look to see if you're in compliance. So it's all in a zoning ordinance that we have to, that we regulate. But just because you're in conservancy doesn't mean you get a tax break or um, anything else. What it means is you can't build it. Hardly any. It's it's a very strict district. Yeah. Um, going along with, with what Jim Bailey is asking, actually, could you go into the difference between districts and overlays? There is none. A district is. There's base districts created. That's like I said, you're, uh, the one slide I had had the different ag districts, residential districts, business, industrial. Those each have their permitted uses. Overlay district. Okay, the one difference. Zoning districts are created by either property lines or roads, or you can use any number of, of features. Overlay districts generally are created around a feature. Uh, we have a district that's called a well overhead protection layer. So if there's a municipal well, that ordinance applies a thousand feet around that, or a mile around that well. That, if, if you picture your layers, you have your base zoning district, that overhead protection goes on there. Now you might have two sets of regulations that apply to it. Um, in this case, if, if the Village of Friendship has their municipal well, you're here. We also have an airport overlay district. Well, that applies for three mile circle around the airport. That's also on that. Now I'm looking at all three of those districts to see, okay, well, if you wanna build, are you good with this layer? Are you good with this layer? Are you good with this layer? Yes, 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 golden. Um, so, it, it, an overlay district and a, and a general in a, a typical district, there's really nothing inherently different between them. They both place different regulations generally. Um, it's just a matter of how they were, what they applied to. Uh, generally, an overlay is a specific feature or something like that. Whereas when you adopt county zoning, every property gets a zoning district on it. We have a landfill notification area. If you're within 1,500 feet of a landfill, that's another overlay district. We're having more and more short-term rentals coming into our town of Monroe. Yep. And it's creating quite a festive situation. We have uh, people are retiring, building their homes, and then the next year we get a short-term rental right next to Currently, as we understand, basing it on the number of bathrooms in a home, you can have eight up, eight people renting it on a short-term basis based upon one bathroom. So if you've got three bathrooms, you could have 24 people in that building. Is that correct? Close. Okay. Um, so first thing I'd like to point out is if you remember what I said before, is there's a state statute saying we can't ban them. We can't, we can't prohibit them from doing this. So our, our best next hope is to, is to regulate them. Uh, in the ordinance, it is built or it is spelled out. Here's how you arrive at occupancy limits. The first question is, what do you have for parking? 
each parking space and it defines what a parking space is. However, it doesn't say it has to be asphalt. It can be grass. What we're looking for there is you're not along County Z where your house is five feet from the road and you have no off street parking that creates a problem. So can you get your vehicles off the road? Yep. Okay. You get four, four people per parking spot. Next one is how many bathrooms you have. You get eight people per bathroom. The third one is square footage. We don't count kitchens, bathrooms, closets. The rest is livable square footage. You get one person for the first 150 square feet and then one person for each 100 square feet after that. So if I have a thousand square foot home, I get nine people. So I can have three bedrooms, or excuse me, three bathrooms in that, which would give me a 24. I have 10 acres for people to park on. So I, I have like 200 there, but I only have that thousand square feet. I'm limited to nine people. It's, it's the lowest of those three criteria. So in that case, it'd be nine. Um, so short-term rentals are um, definitely something that we deal with or I deal with on a regular basis. And um, we do have, I guess I didn't say that, we do have approximately 200 of them in the county currently. Oh, I did say that. Um, not counting Rome or Lincoln or the city of Wisconsin Dells or the village and city of Adams and Friendship. Um, but does that? Kind of. Uh, follow up to that, though, is if our town does not have a short term rental ordinance, but the county does, you enforce it, you maintain it, you, uh, you give the permit that, yes, you're good to go on your short term rental, yet we will collect a room tax from you. No, so I did put that on the agenda. I was going to talk about room tax. Um, and that is a phenomenal segue to lead into room tax talk. Um, I was actually going to have Carolyn talk just so you didn't have to keep listening to me continually. Um, but let me, let me address that part first. Um, it wasn't going to be that long, but sure. Okay. So do not let me forget to come back to that. I won't, but the piggyback question to it is actually, if we end up putting together a short-term rental ordinance, we can, we're able to do something that maybe is a little bit more restricted, right? Than you can do whatever you want in your, if you have your own ordinance, you can do whatever you want in it. Yet, now the county would not enforce it. Correct. We would have, we would have zero involvement. Employer. For example, town of Rome, yep. people call and say, oh, I want to help rent my house out. Um, oh, okay, where are you at? Well, I'm on Pet Hershel. Oh, no, call Emily. Mm -hmm. We Zero involvement. I have no idea how many they have. I don't even, I, quite a few, but I wouldn't venture a guess beyond that. But you still you have them registered with the county? Right? Nope. I thought they had to be for the Department of yeah, Health. Okay, so that's actually, that's a state requirement. It's through DATCAP. Um, DATCAP requires that all rentals have a, a, a license that meets the standards in certain administrative codes, very similar to what a hotel needs, a bed and breakfast, campground, restaurant, that's all housed in similar areas. A number of years ago, uh, it used to be state inspectors that would come out and look at the restaurant and make sure they're following all the health codes. There's only a few, or not that many state inspectors statewide. So these places weren't getting inspected. So what happened over the last, probably 15, 20 years, is counties started joining up together and doing it themselves. Saying, well, okay, stay, you just stay out of it. We'll enforce your rules for you. Um, so what we did is we joined up with uh, Juneau County and Wood County. And ours is housed in Wood County. That's So when you get your license from the Wood County Health Department, that is your state license they're issuing for you. Um, same as if you own a restaurant down the road, you're getting your license through Wood County, which is very confusing to people when I talk to them, but um, Marquette, Green Lake, and Washera did it. They're housed out of, actually there's one person in each of the three counties that focus on different things. So it's, it's, a, it's a way that you can get staff on without one county 
try and burn the cost or bear the full burden of that cost. Um, so as far as them being registered, it's actually a state thing. We just happen to go through Wood County. Yes. Conditional uses. Once they're established by the town and then subsequently revisited, maybe manipulated by a county committee, does the requester of the conditional use need to comply with those conditional uses? Okay, so a conditional use permit is not issued by the town. Right, but it goes to the town for input from the town. For a recommendation. Yeah. Um, and the town could say, well, you know, here's the 10 conditions. We, yeah, we don't have a problem with it, but we think these 10 conditions should be added to it. Great. Gets the zoning committee, the committee says, well, no, maybe only these five conditions or, oh yeah, we like those 10 plus these three others. And they approve it. And uh, let's just say it's mm -hmm. too, doesn't quite follow with my example earlier, but the, the boat say, or the boat motor repair gets approved. He starts his boat motor business. At that point, any of the conditions apply, any of the conditions that were added to the conditional use permit apply, he has to follow. He starts operating at midnight, even though there's a seven to seven, that's a violation. He could lose his conditional use permit. Um, now let's say he, he had this, these grand scheme, this grand plan to do these, these boat motor repair business and he, broke his back and he's been in the hospital for the last six months and he hasn't, uh, now he, he's just not gonna be able to do it. The fact that one of the conditions was that he had to clean up the rest of the property no longer exists because he didn't use the conditional use, which was to operate a boat motor repair business. If he miraculously recovers from everything, starts that boat motor repair business, those conditions kick in. Does that answer your question? Kind of. Um... Is there an instance where they can decline the conditional uses without an excuse other than I'm not gonna do it because I'm no longer I'm no longer proceeding with my previous plans or, or my requested plans? Well, the conditional use is a very specific thing. So uh, very <laughs> Very, very rarely would you have more than one conditional use going on at the same time. You could have a conditional use with conditions, but the conditional use is the, is, is the focus. Am I doing this or not? Am I operating the boat repair business? Am I, um, did I open my daycare? It's usually a business type thing is a lot of times what your conditional uses are. If you're doing it, the conditions apply no matter what. If you choose never to do your conditional use, the conditions can't apply because you never did, you never utilized it. So now if I started the business, I have to comply with these. I close the business down. Generally the, the conditions would go away as well. So I think that's where non-conforming uses get very, very muddy and confusing because sometimes this property is considered non-conforming. Then they go for their conditional use, but then they decide differently. So then it falls back to the non-conforming. It never actually left the non-conforming stage. So in this situation, um, without naming the location, not that it matters, public record, but um, we have a situation where we have a property that has, is a campground and a mobile home park. There was uh, 11 campsites and then 12 mobile homes. The owner, it, it, I, it, it's been determined, it's a legal non-conforming use. The campground's been in existence. There's some questions on licensing that they were. Fine, our ordinance doesn't require you to be licensed as a campground. The use was still established prior to zoning, however many, however long ago they decided they wanted to get rid of the manufactured homes, put in more campsites. So they applied for a conditional use permit. Additional, at that point, they said, the, the committee approved it and said, here's 10 conditions that apply also. 
the applicants looked at it and said, well, we didn't like the conditions. We're not expanding the campground. So at no point did the legal non-conforming status go away. It was, it's, from day one, it was a legal non-conforming uh, campground with 11 sites. They continued to use it as 11 sites. They were given the opportunity to expand it to is there 20 or 22 sites. Had they put in site number 12, every one of those conditions now kick in because they expanded the legal non-conforming use. They chose not to expand the legal non-conforming use just because a, a, a piece of paper was issued that said, oh, we granted you a conditional use. That doesn't establish the use. That just says, if you want, you can now do it with these conditions. So in this case, they said, we don't want to use the conditional use permit. None of the conditions apply. Now they come back next spring and say, well, yeah, we'd like to. Okay, now they apply. So that's kind of where that's at. Going along that same thing, I think you did mention before that uh, you said the legal non-conforming, that would only save them if they continued on, if they let it lapse for one year. Yep. And I, and I, in my determination in that situation was that they have not. It's been an ongoing use since whatever it was, 80s, 90s. There's been some questioning as to whether if you let your licenses lapse, yep. whether or not then you are still you know, a viable business. Right. And, and my determination is that you are, um, because our ordinance does not address the fact that you have to be licensed. Um, so that's, hmm? the, state. the state says you have to be licensed. So be, be, be licensed with the state, otherwise the state can come down on you. I can't come after you for being unlicensed. And if I can't pursue a violation against you or that property for not being licensed, I can't really hold it against you either. So that's, that's how I came up with that determination. Yes, Tanya. So if they were grandfathered in as long as they didn't move forward on the changes, that they just kept their grandfather. Yep. Yep. My question is if they had put in that 13th how long is that conditional use permit good for? Until the business closes? Do they have to reapply every year? Nope. So there is nothing in default that if you start using the conditional use, so whether it's that one or um, I want to have my daycare, um, conditional use is granted to me. There's nothing by default saying when it expires. It's good forever. It's also not just good with me. That's I can sell the property 10 more times. Conditional uses, variances, special exceptions, and rezones for that matter, go with the property, not the owner. A very common condition, uh, typical condition that gets put on a conditional use permit though is um, this expires upon transfer of ownership because and that, it, it's tough with the variance because if I'm telling you or if, if the Board of Justice says, well, yeah, you can build eight feet from the property line, but if you sell it, it has to go away. That's, that's a difficult situation. So you don't see it much there. But with conditional uses, hey, uh, you presented a great plan. Uh, if you operate this way, which is how we're requiring you to do it, great. We don't know the next person is going to operate it necessarily the same way or as well or anything like that. So a lot of times that is a condition. It doesn't have to be, but it is pretty typical. Uh, another one is depending on the nature of the request. And a lot of times that comes to the outlay necessary is uh, you have to come back to the board of Re or board of adjustment in two years for a review to see how it's going. All of a sudden we're getting a whole bunch of complaints. We could revoke it at that time. Um, so that, that's not super common. And a lot of times that's more of a use than if a structure is involved. Um, we're going to be doing chicken processing in our barn, but we're opening it up to the public and all the neighbors show up saying, well, you know, that's going to smell and whatever else. And okay, well, yeah, you can start doing it, but we, we want to take a look at that again in a year, but that would be up to the board of adjustment. I don't, they don't give me a sit. Would that, be included in the conditional that would be a condition. Right? Yep. Same with expires upon transfer of ownership. Um, and then what, and the other thing is, is on a conditional use special exception, if you come to me and say, and, and let's go back to that commercial swimming pool, 
this is the size of the pools. Maximum capacity is 200 people. We're gonna have a parking area for 84. Let's just say those were all put in as conditions. Um, our hours of operation are gonna be seven to seven. Uh, we're not open on Tuesdays. And those get put in as a condition and that's what you applied for. Sorry, not as a condition. If that's what you applied for, you have to operate that way if it's approved. You can make it circular. Like you can reduce the number of hours that you're open as long as you don't go. Yes. So if I say I'm going to be open seven to seven, I can change it to nine to five. If I want. Correct. You're you're still within. That's your max. You can be short. But if you start operating six to six, or six to eight, now we have a problem because you said in your plan that you presented to the board and that the town looked at and all the citizens looked at, you said this is what it was gonna be, that's what you have to do, or that's your outer limits. Let's go that route. Yes, sir. Um, proceeding to permitted, conditional, and prohibited uses. Mm -hmm. Before your position, code was interpreted differently by previous zoning administrators. How do we get away from interpretation? Because employment offices change, people change. Um, you've got you've got potential you've got potential interpretation problems in your future, in everybody's future. How do we get away from interpretation? So a lot of that is is how the ordinance is written. Um, not leaving it vague, um, having a having permitted, conditional, and prohibited is the is the number one reason there's an issue. You can't have all three, because if, for example, you have permitted uses, and 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 I, I kind of touched on this before. The only thing that's allowed in a district is what's listed as a per permitted use. It's not listed as permitted use by default, it's prohibited. So to have a prohibited section and say, these two things are prohibited. Well, now you have permitted in R1, had the list of whatever it was, eight things. You have your prohibited, you have your conditional uses. I want to put in a uh, car repair shop. Well, it's not listed in any of the three. So what is it? So that's why zoning ordinances should have a prohibited use section. You have your permitted, conditional use, everything else is prohibited. That gets rid of interpretation situations. In general, that's that specific example, but in any part of the order, it's not just prohibited or permitted, conditional use prohibited. It's how it's written. You know, you have to you have to be clear that this is what it means and this is what it is. And for the most part, the ordinance is is very clear on a lot of that. Uh, I think any ordinance that's ever been written in the, probably in the country, has interpretation involved in it. And to write a perfect ordinance, especially something like zoning, where it's, it's a long-term thing, it's been around since 1983. In 1983, did any of us have any idea that we'd probably be deal dealing with cell towers when this original ordinance was written? So things happen, things change, but it's, it's, it's a long-term document, and you have to think a long time ahead. So clearly, is there permitted and prohibited? Yes. And there has been since, well. I guess my question is you're missing something. Like you're, you're missing that she wants a ferret farm. It's not prohibited, but it's not listed as permitted. I mean, if it's, if you're saying if it's not listed as permitted, permitted, it's by default prohibited. By default, if it's not listed in the permitted uses, it's, it's <laughs> prohibited. And, and how long I'm looking at how things change. So in five years, things have changed. The, you know, now everything's technology based or whatever. How is that going to affect? Wouldn't it be better to only list the prohibited and the and then no for for the simple reason that the purpose of zoning is to keep similar uses together. Um so in the example I gave of the of the, the cell tower. Uh, 1983, we say, well, this is the residential area. We don't want factories here or slaughterhouses um, or business. 
okay, cell tower really, nobody ever thought of it. It's really not a business, it's, it's a structure, but it's not a slaughterhouse or any of those other things. So can we put it in the residential area? If all you said was prohibited. So you go the other route. And this is, this is, is, is how it is countrywide. It's not unique to Adams County. Um, I think you'd be hard pressed finding another place that has prohibited uses listed in a given district. Um, it's very clear that any areas that are R1, which is say this whole block, we want all the houses to be, or mainly what we want there is houses. So houses are permitted use. And these other things that kind of go along with that. You do have the conditional uses, which opens it up to a, a fair amount more, but it's not permitted just as coming in and asking that I want to put in, like you could with a house. The prohibited just murkies the water. Oh, no. One more, actually two. Um, I'll make them fast. Buffer zone. May a property owner receive assistance from land and water? Uh, we do have a number of cost sharing programs. Um, depending on the situation and how it's done, very potentially, yes. How about just advice? Oh, absolutely. That's like. Function. To be aware of that. Yeah, and that's why I brought it up. That, oh, very first thing I said when I got the land and water part, everybody's coming back from break, nobody heard it. Um, the shoreline site visits, that's, hey, I'm having an issue, or I want to improve my, my lot, what can I do? And, and a lot of people always default to let's just put riprap in. Well, there's a lot of other choices, and that's... And that's exactly what they would do. Last question. When a dam is retired, decommissioned, I don't know the proper terminology for it. Does FEMA alter its floodplain determinations or do the people that are on the floodplain need to initiate that action? The people or the community? Um, either. Uh, FEMA rarely goes out of their way to do anything on their self-initiative i know it's just my daughter in case anybody was wondering <laughs> no they're fine but i was actually looking for something um so generally it's created by either um initiated by either the the owner or the community a lot of times depending on the ownership of the dam or the situation in any given thing um the the community has the study done because that's always the first part. FEMA is not going to change anything unless you have an engineered study done or like say when you re, uh, repair a dam. Um, I know that situation happened in, or they replaced the dam in Harrisville. They had a whole detailed study done. There's a process you go through to get FEMA to adopt that study. And then that floodplain is what exists. All right, so. Another question. Oh, yep, quick sure. Uh, if you have a, uh, you have a building permit uh, ordinance for the Adams County. Our town also has a building permit ordinance. Okay, so if they go to you to get their permit to go ahead and start building their building, their house, and then two years later they want to do a garage, or even back then, just on the house, do you let that per that applicant know that hey? P.S. You also have a building permit process that goes on in the town. So when there's duplicates, <laughs> do you advise them? You better talk to the town because some of our people don't know that. Yep. So. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um. So a couple that that that's a uh, seems like a very easy question. Do you do you let them know? Yeah. That that's 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 a loaded question is what it is, and um. The, the first part of my answer to you is uh, just in terms of uh, terminology, you don't issue a building permit. Right. You issue a land use permit. So uh, in our case, we would issue a zoning permit. Because remember, zoning permits, land use permits, kind of interchangeable, is what you're building and where you're putting it. Building permit is how you build that. 
So in this situation, and, and the other reason I say it's a loaded question is because your town is the only one that does that. Yes. Um, and, and for the most part, we, we do everything I can, we can, to send people to you guys also. Um, the issue becomes when you have a zoning or when you adopt a zoning ordinance, excuse me, when you adopt county zoning, the town is giving up land use control. If you have an ordinance that says, well, we want all houses to be 10 feet from the property line, you have them the town level, the town cannot enforce that once you adopt county zoning. Um, if you haven't adopted county zoning, for example, big flats, they can because that's their ordinance. There's some special things that have to happen um, in terms of the county, but for the most part, it's, it's them. And, or it's them, their ordinance just has to be approved by the county board. So it's difficult in your, in your guys' situation to send people to you because you, there is no ordinance to regulate it or for issuing that land use permit. Uh, because once you guys adopted zoning in 2018, all the land use decisions came over to the zoning, except in variances, conditional uses, what I've been talking about with the special processes. Um, but the short answer, too late, is yes, I do send people to the town for that purpose. I have a quick question for you. Um, if you're going to do a zoning in your little your little thingy that says that it's sent to everybody within a certain number of miles. 300 feet. Okay. You neglected to say except when it's going from ag to ag. No, nope, you still get one. Any rezone process, because it has nothing to do with what the districts are changing. A rezone requires public hearing. The public hearing requires that we notify everybody within 300 feet. If it's in the there is no such thing as rezone from the same district to the same district. No, from add, add one to add one. If you go A135 to A115, if you're applying to do that, neighbors are still getting notified. It still gets published in the paper. The town clerk gets notified. Town board gets notified. The town still weighs in in the same process. Well, I can guarantee you in the last three and a half years. That's all I can speak to. Before that, I don't know. Yes, sir. Related to that question, oh, let me take a second. Um, on that rezoning request, the, you know, the towns fill out the application, object, not object to the rezoning. What do you look for and what qualifies a rejection of the zoning from a town town level? So we, we submit it to the yeah. county and there's certain qualifications that you look at to make sure that it's a reasonable objection for or not objection what are the things you look for and what should the times be doing sure so you, I, I think you're talking about that town participation request for town participation form yeah, yep take the board. Yeah. okay so i've heard of a couple of different ways the towns like to address this uh we we do have one town that um well they're not real fond of the idea of this person doing this, but we're gonna leave it in the hands of the committee. So they'll for, fill out the form and just say, we object and the reasons, whatever your reasons are. Well, not compliant with the comprehensive plan or well, they're asking to put in a factory on this industrial property or change it to industrial and it's in the middle of a subdivision. You know, so, but, but they're not really super against it. Let's just, leave the county, let them decide. At that point, whatever you put in there is what the county looks at. Filling out that form is not a formal objection. It does not place any limits on the committee. That is just, eh, don't really care for it. Same with the approval side. Uh, you, you approve it, it's not binding anyway, but you put on there, oh yeah, we think it fits in great with the area. Um, everything else around there is industrial, that it just makes sense. So however detailed you wanna get on that, that's up to the town. But know that the committee does take what you say very seriously. Um, if the town is, okay, we do not want this in any way, shape or form, don't use that form. 
you got to use, and, and this is where you then contact your town attorney. Certified copy of a resolution of disapproval. It's, it's not just a, a piece of paper that says you, you object. It's, it's a whole resolution that the town board has to fill out or you're right. You adopt it like any other resolution you would do. You, 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 the town board signs it. And then there's a cover letter that goes with it that the town clerk attests that this is a true and correct copy of this. And then somebody has to deliver it to the town or to the county clerk. Once that happens and all those things are there, now it's officially an objection. The committee can only deny it or approve it with changes. There has to be some reason behind it. You can't just do it with one. All land use decisions have to be consistent with the comprehensive plan. So if your land use decision is, well, they want to go from A135, 35 acre minimum, to A3, which is five acre. So it's still ag. Your, your comprehensive plan says this is an ag area. And you say, no. Is that decision consistent with the comprehensive plan? Well, they want to go to an ag district and it's ag. Ultimately, that would only get settled in a court. Consistency with the comprehensive plan on a land use decision is only settled at the court. But that, yes, it would be great if you had good reasons for denying it. But depending on how good your reasons are is how much weight the committee is going to give it. Okay. Simple question. Okay. Do you still need a Yes, that requirement never changed. However, you heard me say there's two types of permits. Okay. There's a zoning permit and a building permit. Zoning permit looks at what you build, where you put it. That permit is very, never changed. You still need that. Right. We are going to come out in. Correct. Right. Okay. Other than that, we do look, you do have to stake it out. We look at where it's going, right. but how you build it. That's on you. Shed you're supposed to build? Isn't there no, kind of we do not. As a zoning department, we do not regulate ugly. I, don't we do not regulate ugly. <laughs> um, I know the property you're referring to. Um, the sheds there are in compliance. Um, even before the ordinance was changed a few years ago, those sheds are small enough they wouldn't have fallen under that code anyway. Um, and the code basically uh, was supposed to be looking at snow load. It, it doesn't, even on a house, we don't regulate whether it looks good or not. It has to be built to a certain standard, but that's a, a safety sign. You can put multicolored siding on it or whatever you want. We don't regulate that. Um, the issue that we run into with, with the property you're referring to is the question of whether they're actually living in those sheds or not. You and I might, I mean, I think you're, there's two problems. Oh, okay. <laughs> but I understand you, I Correct. know exactly which one you're talking about. I'm talking about the other one as well. How do you, how do you stop that kind of just throwing pieces of wood together and then that's their shed? Right, and, and, and this, and, the ordinance before didn't kick in until 150 square feet anyway. And a lot of these, the, the ones I'm thinking of, and I think the other ones you're talking about are under that 150. So there really never been any regulations. And a lot of communities don't regulate that. Um, some do. Yeah, so 10 by 15. So if I'm putting up a 10 by 10 shed, to this day, you still don't need any type of permit. You never did. Um, but people choose 
to do certain things. And just because it's not something I would put on my property, doesn't make it wrong. All right, well, I'm guessing you guys are probably done listening to me. Carolyn, you have 40 minutes. Oh, no, I need the last, like, how long do you need? Perfect. Okay. Uh, by the way, from the Land and Water Division, this is Carolyn. Uh, she is our land resource specialist, and uh, you can take it from there. <laughs> Hi everybody, I'm Carolyn Prawley. I am your land conservationist as of last July. So I joined the department in July. I'm happy to see a few familiar faces around the room and hope to get to know more of you over time. So what I'm sharing with you today is just a brief overview of our county forest program. The reason we wanted to share this today is because it is a relatively new program and we're hoping that you'll help us inform the public about the county forests and just help members of the public use this resource that we have within the county now. So over the next 10 minutes or so, I'm going to be telling you about, oh, should I pause for Zoom sharing? You can, you can keep talking. Okay. You were shared, but it was sharing everything. And I am getting over a head cold, so I apologize if I'm a little froggy. Let me know if you can't hear me. But some of our main achievements in 2022 were mainly getting this program formalized. So this is a little bit before I joined the department, but we had the formal creation of the program with the ordinance last January. And then last March was when this really comprehensive 15 year management plan was prepared, which is kind of all the soup to nuts about how we manage our county forest. So that's our main guiding document between the plan and the ordinance. Another big focus that we've had, especially since I started in July, was researching potential acquisitions to expand our county forest. Right now it's very small, but we have recently gotten approval from our committee and the county board to pursue some other properties to expand our county forest. So we looked into about 5,000 acres across the county. The way the program was written, the county forest can occur anywhere within the county. Right now, it's just in the town of Rome, which I'll show you more in a minute. But we're focused on pursuing acquisitions of about another 598 acres in Rome and Big Flats. So that's kind of our top priority for acquisitions in the near future. Though if there are other properties you're aware of that might be good candidates for county forest, that's something I would love to talk to you about. Another big achievement we had this um, kind of last summer and fall was just continuing to develop this program, relationships with our counterparts in the DNR and our neighbors in Juneau County and elsewhere. We did install a couple of signs adjacent to our existing county forest properties. So those are there to help members of the public just know where the county forest is and what kinds of uses are allowed on those properties. So before I tell you more about our specific county forest lands, I wanted to zoom out to the state level. The county forest system is the largest public land holder in the state, which I think is kind of a, a little known secret. There are over 2.4 million acres that are enrolled in county forest lands throughout the state, which is about 14% of all the forests in the state. The bigger portion are private landowners, and then the state also owns a lot of forests. But the county forest system is a really important player in the management of our forests. There are 31 counties that participate, including us. Douglas County is the largest. They have over 280,000 acres. We are the smallest, we're also the newest, and we have 140 acres. Most county forests are in kind of somewhere in the tens of thousands of acres. Vernon County is kind of our closest counterpart. They have about 1,900. So county forests are important both for our economy and our environment. So Environmentally, they're supporting those healthy forests. 
with robust wildlife habitat, just the forest itself is providing all those natural resources, helping support clean water. Economically, the county forest system contributes about $35 million in revenue to towns and counties, which I'll explain a little bit more about how that revenue process works. And as well as the forest industry is a really important economic player within the state. It's the number one employer in a lot of the counties, especially in the northern part where these county forests are very large. And it's the number four sector for employment in Adams. Another important part of our county forests is how they support other sectors like recreation and tourism, which the bigger our county forest is, kind of the more it can support all of those different uses. As you can see with this map, most of the county forests are in the northern half of the state, so we are one of the southernmost county forests. So let's talk about our county forest. This is a map that we generate through a program called WISFERS, which is how the DNR kind of keeps track of all the county forest lands. So we have two different properties that make up those 140 acres currently in our program. There's 40 acres right up by Lake Camelot. Each of these different areas, the forestry term is a compartment. For our purposes, they're sites, but <coughs> compartment is a term you may hear when people talk about county forests. So right across from the Lake Camelot Dam, kind of uh, along Apache Ave is our compartment 102, which is 40 acres. This is mixed oak, jack pine, some red pine. And within a compartment, you have different stands. Those of you who own forests or are familiar with forestry might be familiar with that term, but a stand is kind of where the tree community is similar. So stands are almost like zoning within a forest. So we do have a harvest planned for this compartment in 2023. That will most likely happen toward the end of the year, but that will happen on stands two, four, and six, which are sort of around the eastern, southern, and western boundaries in the lighter colored areas that are more dominated by oaks. So that sale is coming up soon. Hopefully we'll make it through before our battery goes. Our other compartment is our 100 acre compartment and this is just south of County Highway O. If you're familiar with where the Seven Sisters Quarry is, it's just next door to that. This is you know, a bigger area, it's 100 acres versus 40. It's mostly mixed oak and jack pine. We don't have any harvest planned here in 2023, but we do have some coming up the following two years. So this is something I'm not gonna bore you with too much in terms of the funding for County Forests. But it is important, and I think it's you know, important to know how this works. This diagram is showing one of the important funding sources for county forests. It's called the Knowles Nelson Stewardship. Three here is because we've just completed steps one and two in this process, going before our committee and board to seek their approval to pursue this grant, which would help us purchase those acquisitions. We will always you know, be going back to them when that purchase was actually ready to happen for their approval or their denial at that time. But what this stewardship grant does is it completely, just no out-of-pocket expense for the county, it provides 50% of the purchase price of that acquisition. So right now we're in the process of applying for that grant. And the reason we're applying for this one specifically is because we've been told by DNR and some other county forest partners that we're a really good fit for it. The Joint Committee on Finance that allocates and decides who gets those grants has really indicated they're most interested in funding acquisitions south of Highway 64. And for some other reasons, we are really good candidates to receive this grant. So that's something that we're in the process of doing. The rest of the money for an acquisition when that time comes, comes through a DNR project loan program. So that's a 0% interest bearing project loan through the DNR 
which is repaid through the timber revenues from that property. So it's really not something that's coming off the tax rolls or that the county is coming out of its budget or asking more of the towns to make that purchase happen. It's something that as the harvest on those lands happen over the decades, it repays that loan. The reason we're interested in these two acquisitions in particular, or kind of these two tracts of land as a single acquisition is because they support multiple goals in our county forest plan. So that's that sustainable timber harvest over the decades, selling that you know, to support our paper industry and our whole forest industry, excuse me. Some other environmental reasons we're really interested in these two tracts of land are for the watershed protection potential that they have and those recreational uses. So that's things like hunting, hiking. There aren't rivers specifically through here, but you know, there are wetland areas with other you know, opportunities for recreation in the upland and wetland areas. So this is zooming in on the more northern one of those tracks, which is about 240 acres in the town of Rome. This is pretty close to our existing county forest, and there's a lot of nice kind of contiguity within the watershed, so supporting a lot of those ecological functions. The other parcel is in Big Flats. It's a bit bigger. It's 358 acres. And there's, on both of these properties, kind of a mix of pine plantations, mixed oak and pine areas, and wetland areas. So we are still in the very beginning stages of pursuing these acquisitions. But if we were to go forward with them, it would more than quadruple our current county forest and make us a lot more effective in meeting those long-term sustainable goals, which you just need to have a certain scale to be able to do. So where I'll end up today is just kind of telling you about what our goals are for the year ahead. These are detailed in our annual work plan, which is also approved by our committee and board. So we are doing that first timber sale on the compartment by Lake Camelot. That's a 24 acre salvage cut, they call it, just because of the condition of the stand, it's not very dense. Some of the oaks are dead, so that's why they call it a salvage cut. What that involves is establishing a bid opening where we kind of put a plan together and tell loggers what kind of bid we would accept for someone to come and perform this harvest. We'll then monitor that harvest as it happens, and then after it is harvested, go through a regeneration process to replant it so that there's that sustainable forest resource for the long term. These are some numbers that our county forest liaison has projected given kind of the current timber market. These are probably some of the lowest numbers we'll ever see just because of the current market conditions. So because it's a relatively small harvest this first year, it's a relatively small number. And then it'll go up in 24 and 25. And then we'll keep you know, following our 15 year plan, which of course will change if we have those acquisitions and have other harvests we might be doing. Something I want you to know, if a harvest happens in your town within the county forest, 10% of that revenue off of that harvest goes directly to the town. And that's a state statutory portion that 10% of any county forest harvest goes to the municipality in which that harvest was done. So that's kind of a nice perk between the towns and the county with these forest lands. Another goal that we have is just to continue with this process of pursuing these grants and that DNR loan, and that will eventually involve the appraisal of those properties negotiating that purchase price and returning to our committee and board to go through all of that process as well. And we also just want to continue improving what we're doing already with that recreational use. I hope you'll encourage hunters to go and visit our county forest lands, hikers, other recreators to use these areas because that's a big part of what they're for. So we're going to be installing more signs. We'll have our surveyor out there to mark some of the boundaries along private 
properties to make sure that those are clear to members of the public using these lands because we really want to encourage those allowed uses. One thing that is important to remember is there are some things that are not allowed. We don't currently allow camping or campfires or any kind of motorized activities like ATVing or snowmobiling within the county forest. So those are some of the things that are restricted in the ordinance and in the plan. But kind of any foot traffic or any other hunting, there is one hunting restriction that it's bow only on the Lake Camelot part of the county forest, but on the county highway O forest, there are no restrictions beyond all your regular hunting rules. So that's all the information I wanted to share with you. Really appreciate your attention. I can take a couple of questions maybe, but I know we still needed to return to the room rates question and any other topics that you felt were important. Any county forest questions for me? Yes. Why is the county forest not opened up to ATV or anything like most of the townships are, at least around the outside edges? So I think at that point, it was mainly just a, a management decision within the ordinance and the, the plan as it is written so far. I, I wonder if Dusty might be able to speak to that more. I wasn't involved at that time in that decision. I wasn't just here yet. I didn't have the privilege. Um, uh, the county forest program has only been in existence here since April or March. March, March. yeah. Um, so we're, I mean, we're at nine months. So a lot of those decisions haven't been. Um, we're we're still in our in, in, in the beginning stages, um, but a lot of those decisions. The forty acre piece, I'm not sure. As far as UTV or ATV use, um, you know, if it would make much sense. A lot of it depends on trail connectivity. Um, plus right there, you would have both those properties are within mile, two miles or something like that of Derek Hughes. True. Um, right. But depending on where it is and where they're coming from, they use that to get to it. Right. And, and depending on the, on the, the location of trails, if, if we were to, um, I think right now it's partly just that there aren't trails within right. those properties. Yeah. We didn't go in and create trails. Um, there's been talk about, like, say, horseback trails, too. Um, none of these existed, so it's a matter of, okay, let's let's see where we're going with this and, and, and not do it hap haphazardly. Um, if on the 600 acres there's already trails existing, you know, I, I don't foresee where we would, no, no, they're not, you know, close them off or anything like that. Um, but as far as creating new trails, I don't, we're not probably at that level yet. Any other county forest questions? Yes. What is that property currently? I guess I'm thinking of more property being taken off the tax rolls and that 10% probably isn't gonna make up for what the township is losing. Nope. So the 598 acres across Rome and Big Flats that we're pursuing is currently owned by Meteor Timber, you know, the big paper company and because those are within the managed forest law program, I think the way we, when we researched it, it was only contributing 400 or so dollars. dollars last year's taxes on all 600 acres. The taxes and the MFO? The, just we the taxes the from MFL. the property. Right. Every single time it goes through a harvest, the township receives money. Right. So now anytime this would go through the harvest, the town would also receive but money. But prior to what it all. It would no longer be part of the MFL program. So anything that comes along with being part of the MFL program is now managed by the county forest. But state statutes require that the 10% does get returned to the town. Um, but as far as actual property taxes go, it's, it was $431.72 Just curious how many of you is probably a no-no word, which is called grandfather. Um, as I have lived a number of years, I have seen state programs be created and offered and then changed. So the county forest guidelines are coming from the state. 
Are we locked in at a certain stage? So we're grandfathered in at, at this version of County Forest, but maybe not, you know, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now. It's a very interesting point and, and question. I, I think an important aspect of that is because we're a member of the County Forest Association, we have a lot of leverage with the legislature in terms of, of how the county forest system is operated within the state. So I, I don't think we'd be stuck with any kind of statute in a grandfathered type of sense, but maybe Dusty has more let, information let about me that. Restate your question. Um, currently, the, the state statute say 10% goes to the town. Five years down the road, the state says, well, we don't like that statute anymore and change it. Are we locked in it still having to do the 10%? Is that along well, the lines did of- we, Did we go with the times? Or are we- We have an ordinance in place that is based on, we have an ordinance and a plan that are placed based on the current the, the statute of administrative code on today. Um, if statutes change, um, say in how we have to administer our program, we would have to follow that. And it depends on how they write the state statute also. Sometimes they say uh, for programs that are in existence prior to this date, you can continue or you have 10 years to phase it out or whatever. It'd be like any other state law. What I can say is this program has been along, around for a long time. and Nearly that, a century, I think. And the 10% has been in there for a good chunk of that. So I don't see like say the 10% going away. Rules change. Um, Grandfathering, grandfathering, now I'm using it, thanks, um, is, is, is a pretty, primarily used in zoning. Um, it, it can be used in other things, but um, zoning is, is where you're going to find that term a lot more. And um, it, it really comes down to how the state writes the law. Um, for example, when they do changes the uh, health codes for restaurant campground none of that's grandfather and that's their, um you have to comply uh, you know very seldom can you uh, continue doing something that they now feel is unsafe and i think another piece that's worth remembering is that you know, the scope of the county forest is really at the discretion of the county board you know, year to year, if you wanted, you know, say 10 years from now, you decide you wanted to sell some properties, that is certainly allowed as well. It's not like you acquire a property and it's stuck there forever. Do you know counties occasionally sells part of their county forest and goes through that process? So the size of the county forest can change both plus and minus. Is that you do have to go through quite a bit to get back out of county forest? There's there's an involved process, right. but it is possible. It's not easy. So I just, I'm just pointing that out here. So Noted. you can't hop in and hop out. We're, we're in the county forest no matter what. If we acquire a piece of property that we no longer wish to have, there is a very defined process that we have to use to get rid of it. Yes. Um, doesn't mean we're not in the county forest. We're just saying we don't want that property to be. We have defined stipulations in our county forest that we're not abiding by either. Going down the path. And I'm just going to point that out too. It doesn't mean that we have to listen to them. And, and there right. are some that are. So. Um, and and uh, we've, we've discussed that at the committee level. Yeah. Um, and I think it was brought up at the county board also. Um, and, and, the, and the committee and the county board chose to approve it Majority based did. on that. Are there any other questions on the county forest? All right. Thank you again. And I don't even have any slides or anything for this. Um, so room tax, uh, I, I did put that on the agenda. I wanted to touch on that because that is something that does come up on the on a town level. It comes up on a somewhat regular basis and it's a conversation that the towns call or conversations I have with the towns when they call. Uh, there's a, in the tourist rooming house ordinance, it talks about the 
you know, if a municipality has a, uh, an ordinance regulating tourist rooming houses, then the counties doesn't apply, uh, town of Lincoln, town of Rome. So for quite a while, there's a, quite a bit of confusion that if I had a room tax ordinance that regulated tourist rooming houses, there's a huge difference between the two. You have tourist rooming houses that regulate occupancy and um, how they need to be operated and, and violations and stuff like that. And then you have the room tax ordinance, which strictly 100% only regulates, do we collect room tax or not? And how you collect it and, and items like that. So room tax, I think at this point, pretty much every community except for a small handful, um, four, five, collect room tax. What that is, it, it's a it's a type of sales tax on a on a stay at a campground, bed and breakfast, tourist rooming house that gets submitted to the town. Uh, mm -hmm. What I've usually seen is around the range of five to eight percent of the room stay. Our office doesn't have anything directly to do with room tax. However, it's, it, it is part of the overall overall program. Uh, the the room tax that is collected has to go towards advertising the community. So if you have a whole bunch of uh, uh, rentals and you're taking in all kinds of room tax, your town creates a, a tourism board. And you're in the town of Springville and, and people from all over the world want to flock to Springville. You guys put together a tourism board and you advertise it and you're using that money. And, and I think the state statute say you have, or code says you have to use 70% of that revenue or that room tax for advertising the community. Now let's say you have a situation where uh, you may not have that many or you don't wanna do your own advertising. You turn it over to the, the Chamber of Commerce on the county level, same thing, 70%. The town can retain 30%. The 70% goes to the Chamber of Commerce and they advertise the community or the, the county instead of just any given community. Um, so that that's the room tax port room tax portion. It doesn't regulate, you know, how many people can stay in the room or anything like that. Um, the the biggest issue we run or we don't run into it. Um, the towns run into is is the collection of that room tax. So it's it's like collecting any other tax. So, to some extent, it's it's on the honor system. You know, how many people did you have rent this year, and how much were your nightly rates and um, if the people are renting through Airbnb, VRBO, the big ones, they automatically collect it and send it to the town. There's, there's really no hiding anything there. If I'm selling it through or renting it through Facebook or newspaper, um, anything like that, uh, now it's more honor system. But I'm committing tax fraud if I, if I don't pay that room tax. So we do have the situation. Um, Town of, I'm gonna go back to the town of Monroe. They uh, they adopted where you have to get a, a permit for room, collecting room tax. And they started on July 1st. Um, they already had a number of rentals that were happening. So we had to get those people on board or excuse me, they had to get those people on board. One of the, the when you're applying for a tourist rooming house through the county, one of the things you have to um, supply me is a form signed by the town treasurer saying, as far as we know, they owe the town of Monroe no room tax. If I don't get that form, they don't get a license to operate the, the tourist rooming house. Um, so that's that's the, the primary tool that we have to make sure that the town is satisfied with room tax. Um, in this situation, obviously these people already had their licenses and the, the town of Monroe was struggling with a handful of operators that just weren't answering them. I reached out to these people and, it, and pointed to a section in the code that said, you have to be in compliance with all applicable laws to your property. As of right now, you haven't gotten your room tax permit from the town of Monroe, or yeah, from the town of Monroe, you're jeopardizing your license. And I I think every one of them called within 48 hours, called the town and got it squared away within 48 hours. So there is that nice tool to get it taken care of. Um, but 
the ordinance regulating the main takeaway, ordinance regulating tourist rooming houses and room tax are, are two different things. There's obviously crossover, but we don't get into room tax other than I need that form that's signed by the town. Um, and through a tourist rooming or the room tax ordinance that applies to stuff beyond tourist rooming houses. Room tax, a room tax or uh, incorporated areas have room tax also. So the city of Wisconsin Dallas does. I don't believe the village of Friendship, or uh, I don't think the village or city of Adams has room tax. I would not swear to that. They have the motel, so maybe they do. Oh, okay. Um, okay. Uh, however, you don't need a tourist rooming house license in either of those areas. Or those three areas. Um, so our permitting process, or our licensing process, where I require that form doesn't exist in the city of Adams. So I, we don't have that tool there to help you out. Um, so yeah, that's, that's room tax kind of in a, in a nutshell. Yes. Some of the problems that we have is that Unless we had a DMO set up before 2015, that we could not keep that 70% of the room tax collected. We have to give that to another organization to advertise. And that doesn't, why is that? Well, um, I don't get involved in room taxes, so I have no clue. That sounds like a Department of Revenue type regulation or question. Um, to be perfectly 100% honest, I don't even know what a DMO is. Okay. No problem. <laughs> um, I, I wish I had the answer, but I, I don't. Definitely. Appreciate the non-answer. <laughs> a question about, you had discussed earlier about um, well testing. Okay. Is there a part in your area where you could elaborate a little bit more on it? You said you started out with three, three pounds, three, three whatever, and you're going to keep continuing every year, adding a couple more. Um, where is this going to, after you do the testing, how do you get the next township or the next, how do you know which, where you're gonna contact the people? Do you just have them apply to you or you apply to them? Okay. Um, so the, the program started about a year and a half ago. Uh, we had $5,000 set aside uh, or put into the budget for this purpose. Uh, we then went and requested another $5,000 for last year from ARPA or from our from the county from ARPA funds. And one of the people in our office or in the land and water division, he's the watershed coordinator for the 14 Mile Creek uh, watershed, which is covers four parts of four counties, but it's in the north part. Uh, the whole purpose of the well testing was to kind of get an underlying basis of the condition of our groundwater. So we had the funding. We knew we, what we, where we wanted to test or what we wanted to test. And it, it became logical that because he's up there, we, let's get some baseline data where he's, where we have this nine key element plan. It's, it's a major grant project involvement. Um, Let's start there. So that's why we kind of started in the north. Um, and all we're doing is just snaking all the way down. Um, so the next year, Big Flats, Richfield, Colburn, I believe Preston, but don't quote me. Um, and that that's this coming summer. Then we keep going and then once we hit New Haven, all that, we go back up to the north. As far as getting the word out there, um, there's really no application or anything. If you already, if you have a well in any of the towns that we're doing this year, you're eligible. Uh, what we do is we advertise the pickup date. Uh, so for example, on a, uh, this year we did, we had two people at each of the town halls in each of the three towns. Um, we were there from, seven in the morning to nine, nine thirty, something like that. And then also at from four to seven at night. And you come, you pick up your, your sample kit, 
give us your name. Say, yeah, we want to do this. You do have to sign up ahead of time, but come in, grab your sample kit. It's on a Monday. Go home, take your water sample. Sorry, you get your bottle. We're back there on the next Monday to pick it up. So you do your water sample, hand it to us. My staff runs it up to Rapids, gets it tested, or drops it off to get tested. You get the results in the mail. So as long as you're the first 50 to sign up, and we do it, uh, we had some stuff in the paper on our website. It'll be around, Jody, do you happen to remember, was it May, June? Early summer, late spring, early summer. Um, I just, I can't remember the exact dates. Um, in the situation of Leola, it, it's, there's not a huge population in Leola. We, what? Okay, thank you, June. Um, we, we struggled getting to the 50 people and we really wanted to, I mean, we wanted a good chunk of each town or a good spreading over each town to be done. And we were struggling in Leola. We ended up doing a, a direct mailing. Uh, hey, there's still open testings available. And we did end up getting up to 40, we did, or 38 in Leola, we something like that. The Richfield, the population's only 158. <laughs> <laughs> in Leola, it was a for a while. There was an electric company. Thing yep. The electric company made the sampling for it. Right. And it made it a lot easier because you could just show up giving your name and they and they did it right on spot. Right. And I understand that that has changed over yep. the years. You know, and I was thinking of how it would actually work. So now if you did, I'm assuming that all the data would still come back to you. No. But would um to to some extent it does, but we didn't if we house the data it becomes open public record. And we didn't want that. Um, well, my neighbor's well is bad and, and it's because of this reason or whatever. So we didn't, we didn't want it to that fine of a, of a resolution. So the data we get is on the 40 level. So yeah, um, there was a well tested in this quarter quarter. Here was the results. There could be a hundred wells there. I don't know which one. If we ever need the data, we have the, uh, the ability to access it through UW Stevens Point. Um, but once we access it, now it's open public record. Um, as the homeowner or the well owner, if there's an issue with your well or either way, you get notified directly and you get the results. Um, but we do get on that coarser level, which for our purposes, we're trying to get an idea of groundwater. A 40 level is you know, because we're not, it's not a regulation thing. We're, if your well's bad, we're not coming after you because your well's bad and making a change. It. We just want to know what, where our groundwater's at. I mean, is this, is this whole area really high in nitrates? Okay. That's where we need to focus some attention someday. And we have a level now, or it should take four or five years to go through the county, start back over. Oh, wow. Nitrate levels doubled up here. What's going on? We start figuring that kind of stuff out. And then what do you do? Figure out, try to figure out why and, and how we, how you can address the concern. I mean, I don't anticipate nitrate levels doubling throughout the entire town, but. Um, what happens if you know that your nitrate level is off the chart? Sure. So uh, if, there, if it's a situation where your well needs to be replaced, contact the DNR because there is a program available right now for for well replacement. Um, I don't know the details of it, but that could certainly be it. Um, if it's if it's nitrate levels, the other, so I said they, they send the results back to you. Usually about, I think it was two, three weeks after the results all got sent out, the gentleman from UWC at this point from the lab comes down. We don't do it in each of the towns. We pick the central, so it was in Rome. Everybody comes there and he talks about, okay, hey, you know, if you have nitrate levels between this, here are some of the things you can do to help fix that. And, and he can go into detail about what the results mean, things you can do if, you're, if your results are not in acceptable ranges. But a lot of it comes down to what, you know, what exactly the situation is. But there, there are programs out there for, for various, I mean, if you're at the point where it has to be replaced, 
DNR has a program along those lines. So what happens if they replace the well in it or make the cell phone? Do they condemn the house? We are not using well testing as any regulatory means whatsoever. And I've never heard of a house getting condemned for nitrate levels. I would, if you're, you as an owner would need to make a decision what you want to do. You know, do you want to sit there and continue drinking that? Do you want to sell the property? But that's, that's unrelated to the government. That's on you, but we can help. I mean, or we can get you in touch with the people that can help you figure out what to do to make it better. Interesting. Yeah. Is this only the nitrates or what are you checking for? It's, a, it's actually a $60, $60 test. Um, it tests for actually quite a bit of stuff. Um, all, your, all your typical stuff, your bacteria, or, yeah, bacteria, nitrates, phosphates. Um, and... And next week you're going to pick it up? Yep. So typically they don't like the kit to sit at the lab over the weekend. Well, they don't. Because, yeah, I right. Mean, they don't like it sitting any more than three weeks. Right. So that's why the drop off and pick up day, or the, when you drop, we're sitting at the table, you come in, drop a bottle of water with us. Um, you do that on a Monday. And that's when we drive it up to the, to the lab. Right. And we do it every year. Yep. We do it for great agricultural practices too. Yeah. And and uh, so I just wonder if it's very important to get the testing done within the three days. Right. Well, that, but that's and that's why we. We schedule our days for that reason. All right. Uh, yep. See you guys later. Um, all right. Only five minutes after what I thought I'd get done. Are there any other one last closing question that you're not going to be able to sleep tonight if I don't answer? All right. I certainly appreciate you guys coming. It means a lot to me and the staff. So I, uh, if you guys think of questions, you know where to find me. Thank you, Thank you guys.